It is 7 o'clock. I will call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on August 5th, 2024. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the agenda is approved as written. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda item. Um, there are two. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The consent agenda is approved as written. Next is the public session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the warrant agenda, I would ask to please come forward and to try and contain your comments to three minutes per person. And if you wouldn't mind just coming forward and introducing yourself to start. Yes. Where do I go? Right up come here. on up. Mostly for the owl for folks online. Yeah. It helps we have right. close. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm here along with my neighbors, uh, Tom, Corey, and Kelly. We live on Fuller Acres Road, which is right off of Greg Hill Road. I did send an email earlier with some information and photos. Um, so my name is Amy Keller. I also live on Fuller Acres. The uh, culvert washed away during the flood. It's been about four weeks, which means that we have to drive an additional four to five miles all the way around Greg Hill. Um, it adds a lot of time, as you know, to get into Waterbury, and it just adds up with work and with kid drop-offs and all of that sort of stuff. In addition, um, well, we have been parking a vehicle on the other side and going around the chasm, mm -hmm. which is another, uh, it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. Can you is, walk down through the culvert? Uh, I don't go through the culvert. We go around, mm -hmm. and there's like a little path that we go up through. Um, the culvert is treacherous and it's likely to give way at any point, so I don't go in the culvert at all. Um, we go around. Uh, school is starting in a few weeks, and if you think about Greg Hill Road, uh, the bus enters at one side and comes out the other side, and there is no place for a bus to turn around. So it's not just us, Fuller Acres, there's eight <coughs> homes between the culvert and Elephant's Rock. It's not just our homes, it's the entire Greg Hill Road, all the children, school children that are on that road that will be affected by that. Uh, I just want to bring this to your attention because we haven't heard anything about Greg Hill Road right. and about the plan to fix the culvert. Yeah. Um, Tom, Kelly, Tori, you guys have anything? I would just like to know if the plan, what the plan is and if it's yeah. going to be built back better or just to be replaced the way it is. I, I can give an update. Okay, done. So, Immediately when the rain stopped, um, we spent a couple days and focused on everything we could fix and that we thought had some potential to get worse. Um, probably two days after the rain stopped, we had Grenier Engineering um, up there doing some survey work. So they, um, they told us the existing size pipe um, was not adequate for the future. Um, it's an eight-foot culvert now. Grenier told us um, the notes here is 400 cubic feet per second, which is about 3,000 gallons at peak flow. It drains a larger area um, than I could ever imagine. Um, so to buy an eight-foot um, culvert pipe, I think it's 115 feet long. Um, the ones we could buy immediately um, in stock to just replace what we had uh, were about 110 grand to buy one. Um, we think um, we're going to get a bigger structure. Um, we think it's um, just a bigger pipe in the end, concrete head wall likely as a part of it. Um, I believe we will have the new structure on site in about three weeks with, call it 10 days to install. Challenge is we thought about temporary measures, but we don't have equipment that can reach down in there. So it's 40, 50 grand to build a temporary measure, which you've got to pay 40, 50 grand to remove after the fact. So I didn't push that at all, just given the cost. And the other challenge is 
we will get paid by FEMA, I believe, if the, de if the declaration is approved, to essentially replace the pipe of what we have. It's not a good project to improve because it's never failed before. So typically you get hazard mitigation money, you can upgrade your pipe, all those things, when you have some history. Um, in the end, I just thought 100 grand for a short-term fix was, that wasn't gonna be reimbursed, not only good, was a lot of money, given all the other challenges we had. But um, we think about three weeks to get the structure, and like I said, about 10 days to get it installed. I did, um, I did email the school superintendent just to let him know that it's not going to be done in time for the start of school. Okay. But we're hoping it's not too long thereafter. Mm -hmm. So you're going to replace it with a, another eight foot to help? No, it'll be, it'll be a little bigger. Um, I forget the exact dimensions Greener came up with, but it's um, not, not a round pipe exactly, a more mm -hmm. um, slightly different shape, but slightly bigger. Call it another foot bigger, roughly. It's, different length and width dimensions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I do have it. 115 inches by 80 inches, so a little yeah. um, with an arch and a natural bottom. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any other follow-ups. I mean, uh, my goal is um, sorry, there's, so there's a microphone up here, so we'd love your comments, but if you could yeah. just come sit up here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kelly? Thank you. Kelly Hackett, Fuller Acres. Um, so in Moortown, perhaps maybe we had heard a rumor that they had um, uh, at one point had had a loan and they replaced the culvert, replaced a culvert or something that happened with um, flooding there. And then when, once uh, the FEMA money came back through, mm -hmm. they were able to repay the loan to just expedite things. Is that not something that we're able to do? So or? everything we do FEMA related is on the town's cash flow. Um, I actually, just today, we got a check for $110,000 from FEMA, which was the bulk of our cleanup costs last July. So everything is essentially on your, on your cash flow or in your line of credit. Um, the issue with this one was we didn't expect to get reimbursed for the work um, necessarily, and, and we just got a uh, disaster declaration on Friday. Um, so part of it is I have no doubt this is a FEMA item. We'll get reimbursed 75% for the long-term fix, at least to bring it to the original standards. But we were a little more concerned about the short-term measures. And then just to follow up as far as um, with busing, will that information, um, will the folks that have children in that area, will we need to um, be getting our, our own students to the school? Or is that some that ha uh, you're probably in that midst of working that through. Will that information come from the town? Or will that information come from the school? That will come from the school. OK. Thanks. Katie? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Katie Gallagher um, here as a Waterbury Center resident and wanted to give an update on a conversation that um, Duncan McDougall from Waterbury Leap and myself have recently related to. Um, a transportation planning grant for Waterbury Center. So you might remember that you know, last week, the year before, the town applied for a Better Connections grant. This is a program through the Agency of Transportation, Agency of Natural Resources, and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Um, the grant was not awarded, but essentially um, the idea at that time was to look at Waterbury Center, specifically the kind of core area around the, the center green and the Route 100 commercial corridor to improve walkability, safe streets, and support the businesses that are in that area. Um, so we wanted to learn more about how we could improve our focus and a potential future application. Um, our goal is, is really to help create a vision in, as to how we can empower the existing businesses and development and assets that we have in this area. We have this. Um, existing corridor and a compact center with a lot of cultural, recreational, commercial, residential anchors around it. Um, 
<coughs> so the, the Better Connections program is a really fantastic fit for trying to uh, bring together these, these different pieces, so that's why we were interested in following up with them. Um, the program provides technical assistance and funding for towns doing these types of planning efforts to increase multimodal transportation options and um, explicitly kind of layer on uh, community economic development and <coughs> optionally water quality. Um, so uh, after our conversation with the team, they felt that Waterbury's situation, our goals for the grant, um, really match their mission well, and I think especially since we've already applied and continue to be dedicated to addressing these um, challenges that we're facing in the area, they seem really interested in it. VTrans in particular is really interested in supporting Waterbury um, to proactively plan the Route 100 corridor, because as they say, there's a lot of eyes on this area. Um, we also think it would fit really neatly into the current town plan update, um, as well as thinking ahead to the, the zoning updates um, could really leverage um, the uh, community engagement plan that we have in, from the planning commission perspective that we have in place. Um, and then the proximity to the reservoir and inclusion of clean and resilient water management would make the application more attractive. And I think, you know, again, as we think towards future use of this area, that would be really important. Um, so they indicated that if we implemented the recommendations, there's kind of a list I can share with you all um, that they would look really favorably upon Waterbury's application. <coughs> Our recommendation is to, is to create a, an advisory committee of local groups. Um, one thing that Duncan has already done is talked with, um, I think, most of the businesses in the Route 100 corridor area. Um, and I, I know that you all have been hearing about a lot of the challenges with, with walkability in that area. Um, so then the logistics piece, the grant deadline, um, would be this winter at some point before town meeting day. We could apply for up to 105,000, that would be the max, and that would include a $7,500 local match, again, if we were going for that maximum amount. So just wanted, I'm sorry? The match was what, how much? It was, it was, uh, it's, so it's 7,500, it's 10%, but the A and R clean water portion of that does not require a match. Uh -huh. So that's the. Okay. okay. Um, so we, um, <coughs> just to clarify what action you need from the select board uh, to move forward with it. So I think at this point we've been in touch with Tom and we want to continue kind of doing some due diligence, just making sure that we have all of our, our ducks in a row and see who else would be interested in participating in this. We're also trying to do some research as to um, what other successful applications have, have done. Ultimately, we would be coming back to propose a final um, application. So I think at this point it's just keeping you updated as to what we are, are hoping for and, and kind of have our eyes on. And when you say we, it's the planning commission? Um, we as in, I guess, uh, Waterbury Leap. Uh, and I would invite anybody else who is interested in participating to, mm -hmm. to reach out. Okay. I think about that grant a little bit differently than the last application, which was now over a year ago, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I think about differently is um, the seminary field. So behind the seminary building is a <coughs> Rhea Shaker Field, I guess, that we own. Um, it used to be a ball field. There's still backs up there. Haven't used it as a ball field in quite a while, but we brush hug it enough that it still looks like pretty decent grass if it was mowed. And, um, but no, no public parking, just seminary building parking. Um, not really walkable, but I think there's gonna be some demands to use that field in the future given we've lost the soccer field down here, these fields need a lot of work, and it might be smart to try to migrate some of the sports to those fields. Do we have uh, access through the seminary parking lot? I'm sure we could work in agreement. It's owned by Downstreet. Oh, and there's, there's some area that we own. So the field itself is the septic system for the building. So great spot for a field, but there's a portion, um, I believe to the to the northeast of the building that's not the septic that could be additional parking in the future. I think it could be worked out. 
Thank you, Katie. And one thing I mentioned too is the, um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, the town plan and phase two of the planning commission is keep communication with them. Of yeah. Course. Yeah. So thank you for all this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public want to address anything not on the warrant agenda? There's Mike. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Mike. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, leaf peeper traffic. Limited uh, oh, initial discussion. Um, and uh, Dan, are you here? There we are. I invited Dan Snyder of Cold Hollow Cider Mill uh, to come in. Um, we had an issue last year. We've had an issue practically every year uh, <laughs> with uh, traffic uh, on a few special weekends in the fall, uh, right around foliage time. Uh, it's not uh, un uh, unrecognized or um, unusual, um, but um, with the navigation now on board with the number of vehicles, people are finding different ways to uh, try to circumvent uh, traffic backups on Route 100, and uh, so traffic gets scrounged all over Waterbury Center, uh, with people trying to move from the interstate to Stowe and back again. Um, so uh, I've had an initial discussion with Dan, uh, and uh, he also asked that uh, Waterbury, um, revitalizing Waterbury, he represented, and uh, Owen is here, representing RW. Um, so, Dan, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about your thinking on this uh, and uh, how sure. you tried to deal with the problem in the past and what you're yeah. thinking for this year? Yeah, I mean, my thinking on this is I, I've never looked at it as a problem. Um, this is our tourist economy in the state of Vermont. Um, you know, foliage uh, in the state of Vermont adds about $3 billion worth of revenue. Um, and I can tell you, I don't, I make up a very, very small percentage of that number. <laughs> um, you know, so I think without this uh, situation uh, of our leaves turning a beautiful color and people wanting to see them, Vermonters would be in a pretty tough spot, uh, as would our state and local uh, municipalities. Um, a lot of the tax revenue that uh, is supporting our townships and state are coming from this situation of foliage uh, that we're very lucky and fortunate to have. Um, you know, internally, um, I took over the business in 2022, October, just slightly after foliage season. I did have the privilege of, of being around uh, behind the scenes during the first foliage season and uh, or that 2022 season and seeing you know some of the setup that was entailed. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and some of the missteps that weren't, you know, taken during that season because I think the prior ownership thought they were going to be transitioning ownership earlier. Um, I can tell you, you know, last year I made a, a valiant effort to make sure that we had uh, traffic uh, enforcement out on the road for Indigenous Peoples Weekend and the weekend after, which is actually a busier weekend for us than um, IDP, um, or IPD. Um, but due to you know a number of other situations, uh, I had reached out to to Vermont State Troopers. Um, they weren't able to accommodate uh, for more than about an hour or so, um, a couple of days out of the three day schedule or four day schedule that they were supposed to be there due to other traffic incidents. Um, you know, this year knowing that their bandwidth is low and they weren't able to accommodate. I've reached out to Washington uh, County Sheriffs uh, in Lamoille County. I'm still working with the schedulers to see if they can supply uh, a traffic assignment. Uh, I'm trying to shoot for you know Saturday, Sunday, Monday of uh, Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, um, and probably Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the following weekend uh, to have traffic assistance you know on the road on Route 100. Um, you know, and then internally on our own premise, we've um, we've added a number of directional signs to try and help you know make sure that, that people aren't congesting our own driveway. Um, unfortunately, as you all know, you know tourists 
don't always read the best or follow directions the best. Uh, so it's, you know, it's more of a, an advisory, I think, to them than, than something that's going to be hard-coded into their minds. But we're, we're trying. Um, and I've also reached out to uh, both Chocolate Thunder and uh, Green, Green Mountain, um, you know, event, uh, uh, you know, ADA traffic control for parking lot assistance as well, hoping to get a couple people in our lot to push traffic from Route 100 into the driveway uh, where I see kind of the primary backup occurring of people trying to find a close parking spot and then backing up 100. You know, outside of that, um, I mean, you called it right off in the beginning. I, I travel Route 100 seven days a week um, going to Cold Hollow. And uh, I can tell you even this time of year, uh, the traffic be begins at, you know, it backs up at the Mountain Road and Route 100 intersection in Stowe. Mm -hmm. uh, and during foliage, oftentimes that backup is all the way to my doorstep. Um, and then the bumper to bumper, all the bumper to bumper, all the way to Stowe, and then from my doorstep all the way to the interstate. Uh, with traffic jams at my location, Cabin Annex, you know, Ben and Jerry's, right down to the stoplight before the on ramp. So it's, you know, it's. I, Will I admit that we are a popular destination during foliage? Absolutely, and I'm thankful for it. It allows me to employ 42 people all year long, who I absolutely love. But, um, but it, there's more to it than cold hollow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to it. Okay. Um, and. Um, you, we've got Owen here from RW. Uh, I don't know if you, um, uh, Owen, maybe come forward. Yeah, yeah. Owen is the Economic Development Officer at uh, Vitalizing Waterbury. Um, and uh, Owen, from your perspective, uh, how do you? How do you see your constituents, uh, members of uh, your group, uh, dealing with uh, issues around uh, weekend police traffic? I mean, most of what I was going to say, I would say Dan said already, um, mm -hmm. is a con I mean, it's an issue pretty consistently during those weekends, but there are a number of other businesses that also promote and attract this traffic. Um, as he mentioned, Tourism is a $3 billion a year industry in Vermont. Um, while traffic is unfortunate, and the Route 100 traffic is especially unfortunate, um, I think that Dan is going out of his way to bring traffic control in here. Um, and realistically, if we wanted to place blame on anyone in that area for this, you would have to pretty much just pick and choose businesses lining that corridor all the way up to so, all the way to here. Um, I mean, I think it's inconvenient, but it's overall a good thing and it helps keep our economies from it, so. I, Roger, from, from my direction, and I, I, I don't get out of this area as much as I used to, um, <laughs> but I, I can tell you, I, I grew up, you know, once a summer going to Cape Cod. Um, and I watched a, a two-lane road turn into a four-lane road. Uh, I did go to Bar Harbor a few weeks ago, uh, and I watched uh, you know a two-lane road there turn into a four-lane road with a turning lane, and often a two-lane road with a turning lane in the middle of it. And I know it's a particularly difficult conversation to have of infrastructure in this area with ever all the flooding and damage that we've seen. <laughs> but I think the the solution you know, does need to come in a form of a plan, whether that's a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan. I hope that this situation of foliage traffic is not gonna go away because we all depend on it, whether we know it or not. Um, and I think the only thing that can really remedy it in the long term is, is planning and some infrastructure changes over time. Uh, it's, it's, again, hopefully not going anywhere. And we can turn a blind eye and ignore and point some fingers for three to four weeks out of the year until it's gone and we forget about it until next, you know, July or August. But it's, it's reality. And I'm even seeing, you know, 
this August and, and late July uh, has been busier than last August and late July. Hmm. And I think, you know, some of it, I think our tourism got shut down a little bit with national news making, you know, a suggestion that Vermont was closed for business um, last year. Uh, and I think we came pretty close to it this year with the national news and just last week, Nora O'Donnell making it sound like we were closed uh, in Vermont. But, um, you know, I'm seeing busier and busier years, um, you know, between Stowe and, and Waterbury and Waterbury Center. And it's, uh, I think it's really, we, we should all work together on some long-term planning of what those true solutions look like. Because it's, it's more than me. Um, sure. Well, well, we just heard Katie Gallagher propose a, a grant to uh, look at, uh, a VTrans uh, grant to look at uh, walkability, maybe uh, traffic patterns could be part of that. Yeah. Um, in the more short term, uh, we talked about seeing if you could get uh, on the, uh, get either the Memorial Sheriff's or Washington County Sheriff uh, booked for any of those weekends. Sure. Uh, and I'm wondering, how far that conversation has gone, and what yeah. you're thinking about it. Yeah, I've reached, I, I, I am, you know, on board with doing it. I reached out to the state troopers last year, um, and, and to my knowledge, I thought I had them booked um, <laughs> until crashes happened. Uh, I spoke with um, both Lamoille County Sheriffs and Washington County Sheriffs. Um, they're trying to schedule it in, um, and I'm waiting for their response, so. Uh, they think they can make it happen, but I think other things have taken precedence so far this summer. Um, I called the follow-up last week, and they were preparing for, you know, impending doom um, somewhere in the states, and they would call me back. But we're right. gonna break one of these. So uh, yeah. Ones here. So it's you know, I, I think their words were, well, you're you're calling and following up with a good amount of lead time, so we shouldn't have any issue. Um, but as of right now, I I don't have a commitment. Uh, besides private firms that can commit, like, you know, Green Mountain mm -hmm. Questions? Okay. Um, I don't think we can place the blame on leaf peepers for any one business, and I love Cold Hollow. Your donuts are why I'm fat. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I don't think necessarily the traffic is, you know, to. Waterbury businesses are not the reason that the traffic happens. I worked in Stowe for years. He's absolutely right. It backs up all the way to the hotel, into the ski resort, all the way down to the highway. Um, <clears throat> the main concern why I brought this up last year after experiencing peeper traffic is that Guptill Road is the access point to a vast swath of Waterbury Center. And when that's blocked up, none of us can get through. Nobody who lives in that area can get through. And I think, well, the Route 100 corridor businesses will be just fine with, with 100 being passable. Making Guptal and the other roads that come off or come on to Guptal accessible to local traffic is incredibly important for peeper season because a lot of us work at local businesses, and if we can't get to work, those local businesses can't open. Mm -hmm. Solution? close it to exclusively local traffic for those weekends. Visibility? You know, Barnes Hill is a hot spot for that leaf peeper traffic. I feel like a lot of people are heading right there, which is tough. But maybe they can come from, they don't necessarily have to come from the stuff I mean, certainly we could put a sign saying, uh, no through traffic uh, or local traffic only. Um, not everyone is going to uh, absolutely uh, listen. Yes, yeah, right. right. Um, like the trailers don't need the sign. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would hope that at least enough people read the sign to not create gridlock traffic on Guptill Road and leading up to Perry Hill, uh -huh. um, which would be the ultimate hope. There are going to be people who ignore signs, just like those 18 wheelers on 108. Mm -hmm. um, but just to relieve at least a little bit of the traffic so that locals who work in town can still get through, mm -hmm. or at least get to the highway so they can get to work wherever it is that they work. 
you want to propose them? What are or you can revisit this later, but. Uh, I'm curious, has there been, I mean, and sorry to interrupt for me out of place, but has there been any, any studies on the, 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 the time that it takes to get from, say, the center to the highway or snow to the highway or anything like that during that time of the year? I'm just, I don't know because I'm still at the office usually. <laughs> I, when I teach at Stowe Middle School, yep. and I, when I leave my school to come to Waterway Village, 45 minutes yep. minimum. What? Those days. Those, those leap people days. Oh, okay. Yeah. That it's backed up. Yeah. That, that. The Fridays and the Mondays. But yeah. that's the weekend. Right. Fridays. Fridays and Mondays yeah. when they're coming in, when they're going out. As you go to Stonewall and around. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you still have to hit 100. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they change the lights, so it's mm -hmm. like you get uh, one car through on the road, and that's it. Because they change the lights, so you don't, they don't let as many people out. One question is, uh, the uh, bridge gonna, on Guptill going to be repaired by them? Yes. All right. Sorry, All right. uh, Chris, you have a question. Yeah. Um, a few years back, I, I had to talk with somebody from the agency of transportation about a uh, curb cut on 100 just before Howard half. Um, and we had quite an extensive conversation, and for what it's worth, um, never say never. Uh, I did mention what were what were the potential of turning 100. Not that I ever would want to see that. That's the last thing I want to see. Is 100 being a four-way traffic. But I asked him about that, and he said pretty unlikely because the state doesn't have enough width. Enough right. so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I suppose you'd have to go through a major. Acquiring of people's property in order for that to happen, so I don't know what the, ultimately the end all solution will be. Um, and then speaking to Kane's point, um, Guptill Road um, literally shut down for hours, bumper to bumper. I mean hours, like mm -hmm. six hours, seven hours, um, from the time it starts to the time it stops. Um, you know, putting a um, traffic detour or something like that through there. You know, how effective it'll be. <coughs> we well, might be worth a try, try right? Yeah, right? What's that? Might be worth a try. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We'll know until you try it. Yeah. Mike. Uh, just add Perry Hill to that uh, bypass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not really serious. Say it louder so we'll all everyone Perry can... Hill. Okay, did you hear that everyone? Perry <laughs> Hill's the next person to go to. <laughs> 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 during that time frame, and it's just solid. But I think a uh, uniformed officer that knows how to manage traffic can do better than some of the stuff we've seen out there already. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely encourage somebody well-trained in traffic control. If the county sheriff is available, are they better off at Cold Hollow, or are they better off at the light at Guptill? Well, I guess the reason that uh, Cold Hollow gets picked on uh, is that uh, there is uh, an import without any signal. I mean, at least there's a signal at Guptill, uh, and most people pay attention to it. Uh, whereas uh, at uh, Cold Hollow, you need someone to stop traffic, let some people in, let some people out. Uh, when there's an opportunity to do so, uh, otherwise things just get jammed there with people trying to take a left turn and come north, uh, down to the north and so forth. So I would say Cold Hall is the priority from what I've seen. Um, anyone care to make a motion about this uh, proposed uh, sign? Sure, if we have close to through traffic signs, I would propose that we we put them on Hollow Howard and then Guptill where it meets 100.
moved to have closed to through traffic signs on Howard, Hollow, and Guptill Road where it meets Milk Hunter. How about Gup did you say Guptill? Yeah, go up to where it meets 100, and then Howard and Hollow are the outlets on the other sides. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? <coughs> uh, yeah, do we need to mention the weekends <laughs> that we're putting the more? Good idea. Yes. Yeah. It would have to be Indigenous Peoples Day, and then what's the other big foliage holiday? Um, oh. Dan said it was the, the weekend so after. The weekend after. Uh -huh. So I think let's take a quick look. I mean, it, it's going to depend on when, when it all hits, right? So um, you're looking at the weekend of Friday the 4th through Sunday the 6th um, with uh, Indigenous Peoples Day landing late this year on the 14th. So again, the 11th, probably Friday the 11th through uh, Monday the 14th is going to be a prime one and then this year I think the busiest weekend is probably going to actually land might be IDP but it's probably you know the fourth fifth sixth is, yeah. is also going to be hot that's when the foliage is really peaking right, right. Yeah. All right. so those are weekends yeah I would amend my motion to include to to exclusively include those weekends Any further discussion. Just want to say thank you for yeah. coming in yeah, and appreciate absolutely. that you're trying to be proactive. And <laughs> I think that is the bottom line. Appreciate We're your trying. willingness. We don't, we don't want to put anyone out, you know. And our, our staff, you know, feels it just the same. They, you know, I I get phone calls from people sitting in their car saying, "Hey, I know you're dying over there, but I'm sitting in traffic. Mm -hmm. um, Could you reserve some donuts for right. me?" Right. <laughs> <laughs> One better. I reserve the donut machine for them. <laughs> All right, uh, moved, seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I'm Any abstain. opposed? I'm not opposed, I'm just abstaining because telling public works what to do without talking to them always gives me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> ah. well, I'm just gonna represent our public works. Um, and he's had a chance to respond. Um, no heebie-jeebies. I didn't hear any opposed. Uh, any it. abstentions? One. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Dan. And Owen. Thank you for coming forward. We appreciate yeah. it. Next on the agenda is a summary of the flood mitigation held on the 29th of July uh, and the flood mitigation grant update. Alyssa, do you have a, a summary of? Uh, I intended to have a beautiful summary with graphics, which I do not. So this will be a good, I'll do a brief oral update and we can do it again at the next one. Um, I guess I would just say thank you to everyone who came out. We had probably 50 folks um, opportunity to break up by geography and get input. Um, I would say personally, for if you saw the dot voting on the wall, and again, I'll send everyone the numbers. We've had a couple additional votes online. Um, not shockingly, the several permutations of projects at the cornfield scored relatively high. Um, dam safety, or looking at removing dams, I guess was one that I felt like hadn't been part of the conversation, but got pretty strong <coughs> response. Again, recognizing it was like an imperfect pulse poll with those in the room. Um, and the other one that actually had a decent amount of reception at that meeting was just around like a plan for updates and information sharing, just recognizing we had a fair amount of residents, we're soliciting input, and just there's that piece between we know we're not gonna be able to pursue everything, so how do folks know what things are being pursued and on what timeline, which I guess would just say transitions to kind of this agenda item around what group is holding this, how are we sharing regular updates about what grants, what fits in what grants, what might be beyond grants in a separate conversation, um, and how people know to plug into it. And then the other, I guess, big one, but I'll turn it over to Tom when it's appropriate, is the specific hazard mitigation grant that we had said has an extended timeline, so we have through the end of this month. So just to say we'll be able to revisit that at mm -hmm. then our next meeting in August, um, as opposed to the 15th or 16th, which is what we had said at the meeting. Uh, Tom, do you have any updates on that grant and what's been prepared to date, what's envisioned going forward? Um, yeah, I think focus on uh, all the projects that have come up already. Uh, the 
SOR Consulting is, is pretty deeply involved in the work, um, and I think by the the grant is really a pre-application, so by the 30th, SOR will have um, a good kickstart in the study, but the the full study that they're completing won't be done until the winter because the leaves have to be off the trees for the LIDAR data. But we'll have um, pretty good preliminary data by August 30th that we can submit with it. Um, and completion of that study and paying for it can be some of the one of the grant topics too. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the one challenge for the grant is you you submit the concepts with the budget that you have, and then you have you work with the state as a mitigation office um, till the end of the year to try to winnow that list down into what's best and most feasible. And so that'll be the, the biggest challenge. We'll submit, I think, a lot of topics um, and go from there. Mm -hmm. So we could have like 10 different concepts within this? I mean, the, the, the yes, mm -hmm. the, the cornfield is as one example, lowering the cornfield is a project, but the question is, is, is the project lowering it and then, um, you know, regrading it and replanting it? Using some some natural um, wetlands plants, things like that, which and that yeah. that came up at the meeting, and I thought that was an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. I know Mike Bard suggested ducks and limited mothers. Friends of the news could be, would be pretty happy to partner on projects like that. Um, so lowering it is one thing, but the question is, what do we want to do as the phase two? Um, the boardwalk idea was mentioned, so we could have several years worth of projects out of out of one in the end. Comments or questions on this, Alyssa? I just wanted to thank Liz and Nora and crew in general for helping to facilitate the meeting and note take, especially for the online portion. Um, it took a lot of hands. Yeah. And uh, other things that they're doing as well, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what, my name is Joe Hayes. I was wondering if I could comment on the uh, on the summary that was just presented. Please do. I I, I live over at the Huntington Place Condo Association, mm -hmm. and I I I'm sorry I missed the uh, that special meeting last week. Uh, it it sounded like a good meeting. Um, wish I had been there. So maybe some of the uh, what I'm about to say was was covered during that meeting, but obviously there's been a number of flood events in the last year along um, Union Street, Armory Drive, and North Main Street. And I was wondering if that came up in the meeting, the discussion, the special meeting last week, if there's any, any plans to study the flooding that is occurring in this area, any mitigation efforts. Uh, I understand maybe the the town has hired a hydrologist or a river engineer to do some studies, but it's just, it's occurred now, what, three or four times in the last year. And what I've observed, I'm not a river engineer, but what I can see is occurring is a bottleneck down there. The water's all flowing down and it gets to that bridge on Armory Drive. The bridge is very small. I don't think it's been designed to handle the, uh, the, the amount of water that's coming down through there during the flood events. And then there's that bridge that goes underneath North Main Street under the railroad bridge. Um, so you've got those two bridges back to back. They're very small. Again, I'm not an engineer, uh, but to me, uh, they seem under designed for the amount of water that's going down through there. Also, there's debris that's accumulating under the Armory Street Bridge. There's a lot of trees and debris that's accumulating. I don't know if there's anything that can be done there. I know the city of Barrie studied, there were some issues they had some uh, a while ago, and they were able to put some design, some sort of catch system to catch a lot of debris before it got down into the city, to, which was causing some of the flooding. So I think that's exacerbating the situation. Uh, the bridge itself on Armory Drive, I think, was designed to handle tanks and heavy equipment to go to the Armory, and uh, it's got some very uh, beefy I-beams under it. I think they further restrict the flow of water down through that area. 
So uh, it, so again, I, I, again, I, you may have already covered a lot of this, but I just wanted to bring up some of my concerns, my observations that I've seen in the last couple of years, last year or so in this area. Thank you. All right. Sure. Um, yeah, I was actually in the uh, breakout group that uh, discussed uh, that area as well as other areas in the village. Um, one thing that was discussed there was uh, that uh, there's speculation that there's a, uh, some rocks and gravel that has built up underneath the uh, North Main Street Bridge that's limiting the flow of water there. And uh, one question, uh, sort of on an intermediary uh, time frame, was uh, whether we have the capacity to get in there when the water gets down to a certain level uh, to clear that out, to, to open up that pa whatever passages open uh, in the short term. And Tom, I don't know if you have an answer for that. I don't know that answer offhand. I know we don't have the equipment. We do not have the equipment. No, well, then we can't reach down there. But, I mean, this has got to be something that towns across the state. Yeah, uh, yeah. The there's, there's, so there's got to be some... There's easy guidance we can research and, and okay. learn our options. All right. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, enlarging either of those bridges is going to be a little bit of a longer-term issue, uh, maybe more than a little bit. Um, yeah. I don't know if there has been any discussion about uh, re-engineering that uh, North Main Street Bridge. That would be uh, an undertaking. Yeah, I mean, the hydrology study is going to go up Thatcher Brook. Um, now all the way to Neyland Flats, so we'll certainly have some good data about that bridge and the flows there. Um, now it's, I think it's self-evident it's under design for the flows we've had the last few floods. Um, what I don't know is, and this is what the hydrologists will tell us, is is it functionally irrelevant because the Winooski is backing up anyway? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then yeah, I don't I don't even want to throw out a number to. <laughs> work in that area, but probably several times our annual budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, just real quick on that. So the there is a study, an ongoing study occurring now that includes this area I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's uh, been started. Uh, uh, Tom was just saying that uh, we have to wait for the leaves to come down to get the complete uh, LIDAR uh, analysis uh, using new technology to measure distances and so forth. Yeah, uh, LIDAR is actually satellite data, but they can um, they essentially can ping off the Earth and they get um, centimeter level elevations. I'm not quite sure how they do that, but it's at this point older technology, you know, a decade or so old, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But the leaves have to be off the trees. So the study area is from the ice center um, all the way down to around Jenny Davis Road on Route 2, and then going up Thatcher Brook um, all the way to Neyland Flats. And, and when is that? Do, you, do, you, do they have a sort of a date when that'll be published? Um, I think the full one will be completed around year end. Great. And what's the company doing this, the uh, assessment? SLR Consulting. Oh, great! Yeah, they're a local firm. They're really they're, they're really good at what they do. It's good, good to know. Well, thank you. I'm sorry if that was uh, you were repeating the information from last week, but I, I apologize. I wasn't able to make the meeting. No, that was that was great. That was the first I've heard of a debris catch system. Yeah. Oh, so I should have put yeah, yeah. debris removal was high on the list. Yeah. I didn't say it in okay. the in the top three I gave, but just. Thank you, Joe, again, um, for sharing. And I see Eric's hands up, your neighbor. Um, so more on, on the sizing of bridges as well. <laughs> Can I mention uh, something really quick? Sure. Um, I emailed uh, A&R today, and I got a, res I got a call and a response. And uh, they do agree that it um, that sediment and the debris removal um, should be done in that area. Um, I've, I forwarded it. I guess it was forwarded to Bill Woodruff. I just forwarded it to Alyssa, and I will uh, forward it to Tom uh, shortly. Thanks. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Any other comments about the meeting or further thoughts about uh, flood mitigation at this point? 
question. Not to beat a dead horse here, but just out of curiosity, and to, you know, I'm thinking about this whole issue, and I'm thinking to myself, people think I'm loony to suggest getting rid of the whole dam, but I'm wondering if this study has any ability to look at what if that were gone. Uh, what potential might it hold to solving part of, or a lot of, the problem that the village constantly is faced with, um, mm -hmm. simply just by relieving all that ability for that water to back up? I, I don't know. I know it was looked at when the study was done in 2013. I don't know to what extent, but my, my recollection might not be perfect in how I say this, is that it was simply a bit too far but I would like to take a look at that again. Um, you know, is it, it's, it, is there better data now? Is there, is there, you know, have we filled the river with more sediment that's now stopping at the dam? Um, maybe in fact you're right. Yeah, so I'm just wondering the expense that water has to go through time and time again. Uh, could we replace that power source somewhere else and be ahead of the game financially? And, and eliminate a lot of our problem here. If you think about the number of dams that are in our rivers, in Middlesex, there's two. There's one just past the swimming hole, um, just before the Lover's Lane Road, and then there's another one just as you get to the store there, uh, right in Middlesex, down home, it's got a, you know, it's got a debris picker that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, are those, what are those dams there for? Are they servicing anything? Are they just dams that were put in decades ago and, and now have just become of no use? So, I, mean, I think that, uh, Bill, you might have to Yeah, th those two dams and the Bolton Dam have hydroelectric. Right. But, Tom, uh, I, I don't know for certain I think when Alona McBroom did the choke study and when we asked him to look at the Bolton Dam, we were specifically asking about, I think they've got a boom system there that basically allows them to, to hold back more water. It's mm -hmm. higher than the dam. And I think all they did was look to see if that system was not there or would it have made any difference. I don't think they looked at you know, taking out the whole dam and, would that make it ideal? So I think if my recollection is right, just that kind of floating boom that holds back a little bit more water uh, in the penstock or to direct to the penstock to the generator is all that they looked at the last time. So looking at taking out the dam, that probably would be interesting. Yeah. But then, well, there is a natural falls there too. I don't know how, right. how much can be taken out. but. Right. Uh, uh, in my reading of that study, uh, it, it sounded as though uh, that uh, McGroom did not think that that was a significant contributor to water backing up in Waterbury Village. Right. And he pointed more at uh, a nearby farm yes. as being the central choke point. Right, but, but I, I believe the, the dam not being a significant contributor, I think it was just that, that extra boom mm -hmm. that they were looking at. It wasn't, what if the dam, what if the dam didn't exist? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and we can add that to uh, the study. It's, it's just below Jenny Land. I haven't read it for nine years now, so I, I'm not, it's getting better. <laughs> Mike. Just a heads up, um, today we had uh, the a and uh, <coughs> engineer come look at our property that was highly eroded. That's the section of the stream between Henry Huff Road and Perry Hill. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was quite interested in the amount of debris that's still sitting above the Perry Hill five-foot culvert. And so I just wanted to let you know, I know um, Bill is, is looking at bringing a contractor in, but he was alarmed by the amount of debris that's uh, partially plugging that culvert now and, mm -hmm. and we get nervous every time it rains because mm -hmm. um, it, it came from
right across our property, the whole, the whole street. So. Do you plan to give us back our rope? <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> the whole thing? The sooner, okay. the better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other comments on mitigation? All right. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the alley space uh, located on Sco Street. Uh, up to three special events per year, contingent on uh, entertainment permit approval and zoning compliance. I just want to point out the little asterisks there in the front. So this ties directly into consent agenda item B. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, and the reason that we separated these was that uh, one was uh, to have a, uh, a permit for uh, outdoor events uh, in and around uh, the Black Back Pond. Um, but then the second was a uh, sort of indeterminate um, special events permit. Uh, and what was applied for were uh, up to three, or was it, yeah, up to three uh, special events per year, um, contingent on an ent entertainment permits approval. Um, so, uh, Karen, maybe you can just uh, provide a little bit more clarity as to what we're being asked to approve here. Sure. So. Um Eric, Aaron Hill, who is the owner of Black Pack, Black Pack, used the portal, the Department of Liquor Control portal, to obtain his outside consumption permit. And um, the last few years, that permit has been put in place for their outdoor seating on their patio in the absence of these three special events. And then they would have to, and this predates his ownership of the business, um, they would have to come back to us later and ask us for permission to get their outside consumption permit extended for music in the alley. Um, so when he was renewing this year, I suggested to him that he include it. Um, but that, was, that turned out to be a little tricky because he doesn't know the dates this far in advance. Um, so that's why there's a little bit of open-endedness to this. Um, in, in we were able to email, he's traveling right now, so he couldn't be in attendance, but we were able to email, um, and I gave him some suggested language. So that's where, that's, this is where we landed on that suggested language, opposed to up to, you know, the way he had worded it was just a little too open-ended. Roger and I both felt like it needed to be pulled back just a little bit. So, um, it's not included in the consent agenda issue. I don't want to take away his other outside consumption permit. <laughs> So I separated them for that reason. Mm -hmm. I didn't think you'd object to the, the deck and the five seats that he's having. So I didn't want it to be all or nothing. Um, and so under this revised uh, structure, um, we could uh, provisionally grant our approval, uh, and then he would need to come back uh, when he knew the exact dates for the uh, Music in the Alley events? Because right, he'd still be asking for the entertainment permit. He right. just wouldn't need to go back to the Vermont Department of Liquor Control. He would already have that permission. Does that make sense? So he would have <coughs> the liquor permit in perpetuity, but he would need to come back for the entertainment permits? Because he doesn't know the dates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and that liquor permit is just for these three special events. Uh, well, if you approve it, then yes, you're giving him permission to have three special events yes. contingent on the other necessary permits. And it's part of his outdoor consumption permit with the Department of Liquor Control. And if you say no, then we'll go just go back to the old book. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Essentially, this would help him avoid uh, an extra step of having to apply for mm -hmm. a uh, right. liquor permit every, every, for every one of these uh, events. Can I ask a question? Um, I don't know if I like tying the liquor permit to the entertainment permit because simply on the fact that when Good Fire came to us with an entertainment permit that had like 12 dates on it or right. 9 dates on it, 
Um, we told them they would have to come back for each date, and they can't. They just took their application off the table. So are we now telling Blackback that they can have three events on one permit, no. or and now it's tied to their liquor license? No, okay. it, it's the opposite. The liquor license is now tied to the uh, entertainment permit. They will have to come back for entertainment permits. Got it. Okay. Yeah. At least that's the intent. If it's not mm -hmm. read that way, then we should clarify. <coughs> and I think that's just zoning compliance was the other piece. Just the other complication on good fire was if you have more than 12, you actually go to have to go to the right. development review board for like more than seven or nine. Mm -hmm. So it was like a double whammy on that. Three is under that, but just the entertainment. It. So, I, I guess, here, yeah, yeah, my, my thought is just a well, quick question, and, and just to play devil's advocate, I don't see any way where this granting of this, this liquor license, I mean, it just seems like it's saving uh, Aaron a, a step. Mm -hmm. So I don't see, if this is helping out the local business, I don't see any reason not to, unless there is some sort of devious thought about this, but it doesn't seem like there is. Yeah, just to be clear, <coughs> I suggested you do this. Yeah. To save me the trouble of yeah. coming back three times. So if it's helping Karen out, I'm um, on board and happy to make a motion. Sure. Um, I make a motion to uh, grant uh, flatback up to three um, or a liquor license permit. Uh, for up to three special events per year, contingent on entertainment permit approval and zoning compliance. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Mike. <laughs> yeah, I did have a little bit of a question. Is there they have applied for permits. I assume they applied to Vermont Liquor Control to a limited event permit. So is our vote here, I assume, contingent for that permit? We don't need that if we make it part of their outside consumption permit. Okay, so it's part of Blackback's outdoor consumption, not a, a limited event kind of permit. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. They are granted their outdoor permit. FEMA guidance. <coughs> we have three applications. Three applications. Um, I suggest the first one um, to consider be the one on Union Street, which is 42, I believe. Mm -hmm. And since when I wrote the memo on Friday, he was, I, I, I hadn't heard from him 100% certainty he was interested in the buyout. I have heard from him today, um, Eric Rose, and he is on the Zoom call. Um, I'll start up by saying that um, last year he said, Third, uh, first floor flooding three times, um, pretty extensive damage. Um, first floor, I believe, um, in the past was a rental unit for him and he lived above and that's been a real challenge, obviously, the past year, source of income, real challenge, um, financially and otherwise. Um, he is also interested in an elevation and he can submit for both and so we can pursue that. The challenge is, um, State Emergency Management, where this all flows through, um, doesn't do a whole lot of work until you pick a lane, is I think the simple way to put it. So he can be in before the deadlines and have a little bit of time to decide, but you know they're going to give us a polite nudge pretty quick about picking a lane. Um, but I think that opens his options. All right, any questions? His home is situated in between two uh, 
house is already going through buyouts, right? Uh, no. No, he's one. the very bottom. Very so bottom. so if, if he was a buyout, there'd be four in a row on the bottom of Union. Yeah, we've already approved uh, the other three. Right. Right. Um, Eric's on. Eric, do you want a motion for both a buyout and an elevation? I'm just thinking the process. No. Don't do the elevation motion. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm still trying to pursue the elevation just to see if it's possible or not. Um, I've been in contact with uh, Downstreet Housing, and hopefully I can get some assistance from them. And I just, I don't know. I really don't want to lose my house. I, I built it pretty flood resilient, so I didn't lose that much this time. I could build it back the downstairs relatively easily. All my utilities were moved onto the first floor. I didn't lose that much, um, but I don't really want to build it back if it's going to flood again soon. Um, it's only a 20 by 40 rectangle, so I don't know. I've talked to quite a few people who don't think it'd be that complicated to elevate it. And I would like the opportunity to investigate that a little bit more. I got permission from um, Brian um, Eberhardt from the Vermont Emergency Management Hazard Mitigation Team to allow me to apply for both of these for now. And I know I will have to choose one or the other um, in the future, but this at least gives me a little more time to see how possible it is to elevate it. And that's, yeah, that'd be my preference, but I, I don't know. I feel like now would be the time to probably get the buyout approved. And if the buyout, the buyout's probably going to cost more than elevating. So I'm sort of thinking if they approve the buyout, then FEMA might let me adjust it to the elevation if it saves them money. And it would also save the town to uh, two units of housing, which... So that, that's where I'm coming from. I, I also, I'm, I'm just concerned about myself. Like, I don't know, I see one bedroom going in Waterbury for $2,100 or 2000 and stuff like that. And I pay about half of that for my mortgage and everything here. So it's, it's difficult for me to give that up. Um, knowing it's going to cost me twice as much just to rent someplace. So it's a, it's a really tough decision. And, um, yeah, I, I'm scared about losing my house and not having a place to live. Understood. Okay. Yep. Right. Any other questions? The uh, motion. Tom, you said it just not clearly. We should make a motion just for buyout so we have it for the records just so that we can start that process. And the bio, then yeah, in the, the bio, application, the bio, has the, the bio has the official paperwork that okay. we need the motion for and to sign. So if that makes sense, Eric, just to clarify for the paperwork, this motion will be on buyout, um, but we can submit for both, as you've said. Um, OK, so I mean, is it, would I be approved by the select board to apply for both? Or you only have to approve one? I mean, I've got, I've got permission from the state to do it, so I, would open to have the support from it. Yeah, you're you're all set on the elevation. Just this, there's some official paperwork that goes with the buyout. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll move then to approve the buyout request for 42 Union Street. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, Eric, you've got your approval. And Thank you all very much. Uh, greatly appreciated. At the end of the meeting tonight, I've got some, some blank paperwork, and we'll have signatures. Karen's got to notarize everything. Right. Then we'll have Eric sign it later. Okay. Mm, Karen can't notarize it until Eric signs it. Okay, we'll figure that out. Yeah. That's right. All right, which one would you like to consider next? Sorry, it doesn't look like I followed the memo. It's okay. 
Skip is here. Uh, shall we ask him for it? Skip. something else as you get older. Um, you know what, I don't know if you can get PTSD from uh, these, but when you leave at three in the morning and two feet of water, you don't know if what you're gonna come back to and stuff. And Kathy worries about everything and uh, whatnot. So, uh, you know, in our uh, First floor elevation, I think, is right at the 100-year flood. Uh, we're not the lowest house on Elm Street. And uh, we moved everything upstairs after Irene, so it's mud and water in the basement and, you know, all the debris that comes around El Pac and um, stuff. So um, I'd like to look at the buyout. I don't know what I would really do and see what the circumstances are at the time, uh, if they ever get around to, you know, offer it and stuff, so. And I can say that as a career bureaucrat, <laughs> this paperwork is still uh, overwhelming to do this. I almost quit a couple times and said, I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, not, so. You're not wrong. I might do that to you on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could be, you know. Skip, I'm wondering, um, there's a house just two houses away from you that just sold for $675,000. <laughs> Why would you not put out a for sale? <coughs> and sell this problem to somebody else? Well, it's a lot of work to get a house into the condition that one was, plus um, I'm a little, you know, our house um, would probably be in the lower category, maybe a new family. I, I'm, not really wanting to sell it to somebody that gets into the same old scenario that you're going to get flooded and lose all your stuff. I think I'd rather just let the government have it and they do what they want. Well, I'm just going to express my concern, which is that uh, as soon as we start letting houses go on Elm Street and Randall Street. Um, uh, there, we can't rebuild on that site, and we, as a town, stand to lose a lot of housing. We're investing a lot of money right now, like not a lot of money, but a lot of effort in trying to build and create new housing, and this is pushing us in the wrong direction. I can appreciate that, but it's still where it should be. And it's a lot of expense to maintain that house in a place that it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. You know, the next flood is coming. My worry is it's the next Irene or it's the next 27 flood and all this flood resilience doesn't help a bit. You know, it's, it's coming. You know, and I'm an engineer, worked at the Department of Environmental Conservation for 40 years, so dealing with floods and things was, you know, that's just part of your career. And, uh, you know, we've lived there for 45 years um, and stuff in the first, uh, 40, we're good. We just had 
water in the backyard from a ice jam or two, a thunder shower, but nothing serious till Irene, even though you knew about the 27 flood, nobody uh, worried about it and things. And, uh, you know, we're on the corner, obviously, and that's where the water comes down. It can't go up by the cemetery bank. Um, you know, and I, I understand wanting to keep the houses, but you're also, there's an option for the government to change it. And if you say no, you're preventing them from, you know, taking advantage of that. You know, and forcing it on to somebody else to get the insurance and rebuild time and time again. Mm -hmm. So, did Tom give you the whole speech about elevations? You know, you'd have to be five feet in the air. I mean, the hundred-year flood is only going to go up, and you have to be three or four feet above the yeah. hundred-year flood. Two feet above it, but seven feet in the air. I, you know, look like a tenement house in Boston or something going up to the second floor. So, you know, and even if you're filling around, you're going to be filling in the floodplain. If we're filling in Randall Street, I don't know if we get away with that. You know, I we talked about uh, Lowering the gravel in the cornfield, which is going to gain you a few inches, but it's not going to help when Irene comes. So. Well, you may have heard the, of uh, uh, Ryan's idea, which was to elevate all of houses and Randall Street. Uh, build, take the field from the cornfield. Uh, and fill in around all those houses, push them all up seven feet, and uh, so the whole road would be up seven feet. Which well, that would be long way. after I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's a 50 year project. I don't know if it's 50 years, but uh, you know, it's not, it's not necessary. Even if you could make it happen, which I doubt that you could. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's practical. In my honest opinion, I don't want to dampen your hopes, but speaking as an engineer, I, I don't think that's doable. Mm -hmm. Utilities and even the, and the cost to do that for what you save isn't. If you look at these papers, Tom, sent me all the papers till the last one. He said he forgot, which was the cost-effective one um, and stuff. So I think if you looked at cost-effective, that solution is not a cost-effective solution to look at. But I'd be glad to hear any other solutions. <laughs> <laughs> Ken. Um, well, I agree, Roger, that the, the risk of losing houses in the floodplain to never being able to build them again is not my favorite idea. Um, and I'll give Chris credit where, where it's due, where he talked about acquiring properties in the floodplain in other ways and building more flood resistant structures in their stead but that also requires a gargantuan amount of money that FEMA has that we do not <coughs> and so if there's some happy middle ground that can um, quell all parties then I'm all ears yeah, I don't know if I know any answers either. Um, I know I don't. Right. Yeah. It's funny because I just had an extensive conversation with Paul Arnoff yesterday exactly about this topic. Um, the fire station the other night when I had made the comment about FEMA paying half and perhaps a developer paying half 
all thought that was a spectacular idea. Um, allowing the developer to then take the property and try to replace the structure that's there by either elevating it mm -hmm. or completely tearing it down and putting something else there. Um, Paul suggested that, and I think perhaps maybe somebody else, the other night suggested that getting our congressional leaders involved. You know, I look at our agenda here, some of the things that takes us split seconds to change for the betterment of whatever situation that is on the item. Why is it so difficult for, you know, our top leaders at, at the United States Capitol to drag their feet and take eons to change anything that would not only benefit the financial standing of FEMA, but help the communities that they're supposed to be there for. Uh, we also talked about the amount of houses being lost due to the buyouts. Where do you find the space to replace those? Because we are so limited here uh, with available space and quite simply like I said before, there's a lot of large landowners outside the village that simply don't want to get rid of their property and turn it into housing developments and, and they can hurt them. Uh, so it is a difficult issue to uh, navigate um, and looking into, you know, if, if the raising of these structures if I'm correct, I've heard it several times, is a $280,000 appropriation. Is that correct, Tom? Um, there's no, you know, standard number. What I've heard from a few people who have started to move along in the process is for, you know, for a small house, like Eric mentioned his house, to to raise it as something like 40 to 50, and then that doesn't include the new foundation underneath. No, I thought so, FEMA's appropriation. Oh, 228,000 is there. Oh, it's 228. 228 so is there. It's not 280. No, mm -hmm. we're trying to work with them and convince them that we're a higher materials and labor cost market, and we're trying to get them to raise that, but so far unsuccessful. But yeah, 228 is the, is the magic number by which it's deemed cost effective if it's that amount or less. And that's a given per structure, of course. Yes. Yep. And the project has to be 228 or lower, or no, else right. they're not buying yet. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I understand Skip's not wanting to just pass the buck of this property to somebody else and have them go through the same thing. I'm sure a lot of property owners who are flooded or who have been flooded also feel that way, that they don't just want to hand off this problem to someone else. So I would urge the select board to begin thinking about whether that's a responsibility the town should start thinking about burdening versus giving these properties to FEMA. Should we consider starting to shoulder these burdens and maybe using that property for further projects on our expense and whether we can even do that or whether we just want vacant lots all over the all over downtown. Well, um, I guess part of my response was that, that, that uh, in partnership with crew, the town has uh, gone to great lengths in Waterbury in particular to help uh, flood victims out. I know I've been helped out a lot. And in fact, I don't even cringe at the thought of another flood because my basement has been flooded three times in the past year. You pump it out, it remains a little damp as it has been for the last 20 years that I've been living there. And uh, it doesn't really affect my life uh, all that adversely, honestly. Um, but I understand others that, for whom it's a much bigger deal. And uh, I sympathize with them as well. 
you know, I would stay there if you would guarantee it's only going to be six water in the basement, but that's not the guarantee. It's going to have three, four feet of water on the first floor someday. And I'll give you my guarantee, Skip. I don't need to that much. <laughs> You know, and I don't want to be there then. I went through that once. And yeah. It's it's a year long process and stuff. And, mm -hmm. You know, I got it. so. I got it. All right, do I have a motion? Thank you. Thanks. Unless there's more discussion. I'll just say my two piece. I mean, it's kind of similar to what you said, Roger, earlier. I just have to say something that the idea that, yeah, buyouts happening on Elm Street and Randall Street and just keep continuing to pop up is a really scary thought to me. And the idea of vacated lots in those two areas um, gives me a lot of pause to for this. I also, you know, hear what Skip's saying and understand completely. Um, his perspective. Um, it's just, it's hard, especially all the effort we've been put into and the planning commission has put into, you know, phase one um, and seeing that wonderful work come together. It just feels like that we're taking a little bit of a step backwards in terms of losing housing stock um, in the specific area. So I, I hear you, Skip. I, I understand what you're saying completely. It's just, um, I'm trying to be thoughtful about this. Can I ask a question, Tom? Sure. The discussion. So, green space, is that statute or is that <coughs> guidance? That's, that's the law. Okay. So, once, then, once yes. a buyout occurs, the property is demolished. Um, Second part of the we, question. If the town then takes action like we're talking about, flood mitigation action measures that establishes that space now as viable for building is that an approach that is considered. I mean, we're, we're talking so, 10 years probably, right, from now. I don't time. think, I haven't asked that question of FEMA, but I don't think from a practical matter they would consider it, because that space would have to be out of the floodplain completely. I think for them to allow, and that's not going to happen, no matter what we do. I understand. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You just brought up a question, Tom. Um, Chris, mm -hmm. how much each demolition would be a different cost, depending on uh, what type of hazardous <coughs> mitigations you know have to be done, and then the, the amount of debris that has to be hauled away. Uh, is there any idea of what those costs might be any range of what so as it stands now there's no cost to the town typically there'd be a 25 percent cost share so far the state is covering that um i'm un it's unclear to me how far that money will go and, and the reason it's unclear is it's all based on some funding they received last year associated with the flood but buyouts really haven't happened yet because it's such a long process to even get a number that's something I think people should remember is that it's the buyout for any property tonight is approved. It's probably a year until there's a number and then at least another six months until there's a closing. And I hesitate to say that several people may not like the number. And even if they do, they may not find a place to go. So I'm you know, it's not a guarantee at all. So, so I guess I'm, what I'm trying to acquire here is, maybe Skip, you can answer this. Do you recall what it cost to tear down the old municipal building? Pardon? Do you recall what it cost to tear down the old municipal building, even though they salvaged a lot of that? Uh, it be 60,000. I was gonna say, was it like 70,000? I think, I think we're a little north of 100 taking into everything, you know, the asbestos mitigation. Right. And everything that you have to do. So having said that, if you're in that realm of $100,000 per structure, and then the buyout would be 
whatever that value is, where does that get you on the on the dollar figure? Are you into the three three fifty four hundred thousand dollar mark at this point? Uh, it's too bad that that money couldn't be exchanged and converted into salvaging the building, as opposed to the two twenty eight that you're telling me to raise it. I mean, it seems like FEMA's throwing good money after bad to purchase a building, then demo it, and then turn up with a, a lot that's of no use. They could take, if they're willing to throw that kind of money to end up with nothing afterwards. It it's a, seem, seems kind of loony to... It's, it's a typical inflexible federal program. Yeah. <laughs> that's just all there is to it, unfortunately. But they're trying to uh, protect themselves from further costs down, downstream. A bill. Was that pun intended? <laughs> so I've been, I've been toying with the idea, and I guess I'd ask you guys to see if you could put together a group to think about maybe seeing if there could be um, a structure like a public-private partnership that somehow the town could um, structure so that if someone came for a buyout, and, and I, I can't, I don't know the numbers enough if I did, I'm not good like Chris, I'm not a builder. <laughs> the bottom line is, if you write a first refusal for the town to put together a consortium with some either public loans or private money, some combination of that plus a builder that would take that structure, buy it, either raise it or tear it down, elevate it, and put it into multifamily housing or a you know, larger number of units or replace it with something um, that we think would actually enhance or you know, increase or maintain the number of houses. And I think we'd have to sit down, maybe with some real numbers, but real builders, real finance people to sit down whether we could do that and really study it. If you do a right of first refusal, if Skip wanted to leave and didn't want to punt, if wanted to leave and punt, that's fine. We wouldn't be punishing the homeowner. He would get whatever the FEMA money is. The consortium would buy it from him out of right of first refusal. Same money, so he's not at a loss. The feds don't pay, the town wouldn't pay, but maybe the town would use some UDAG money or its ability to borrow at a you know a good rate to kind of keep the risk lower. Plus, it would share some of the risks of reselling the property and then selling it to a you know. Anyway, there's probably plenty of different ideas. But if we put some experts in a room, maybe in the next month we can think of something that isn't a sort of. It all seems really bad to me because it does really feel horrible. Especially, I'll say this: I'm a newcomer. Seeing Skip want to leave town, sell his house, that's horrible. Anyway, just an idea to throw it to the answer. Appreciate that. Yeah. How soon do we have to uh, make this decision, Tom? Uh, August 30th is our deadline. Oh, <laughs> Maybe we've got another task for the housing task force. I would just say, like, and just to echo, like, this, it's not, ex I mean, Waterbury's deeply impacted, but like other communities, I mean, I think Barry had like nine times their annual budget and buyout requests. So, I, just to say, I think the need for state, local, and other programs, because we're sitting here today with objectively a black and white decision around do we, as a town, okay something at zero cost to the town? And I have to say, I just echo, like, Skip is on the housing task force. He's talked about buying that house. And I don't know that anything he said was incorrect. And so part of me says I should make a motion because if he believes that, you know, taking away that option. But I recognize we're trying to weigh um, all the considerations. So that's really hard with limited options right now in front of us. So how? I mean, why is it that we couldn't just put a first right of refusal on these if we ought to say yes, just because it gives us, as a town, or maybe some investors, the option to buy it at the same, you know, it's, how hard is it to do that? Like, we allow, we allow you to, you know, go for the FEMA money, but we get the town or the investor gets this option to buy it first. Mm -hmm. I mean, the FEMA paperwork is, is standard and rigid, so there's no 
you know, there's no checkbox for that option. So all they want to see is their standard paperwork. If if the town wants to, whether it's with town money or, or public-private partnership, buy and rehab real estate, the, the town can do that. The select board can buy and sell real estate on its own without voter approval. They cannot borrow money without voter approval. So as I mentioned earlier, you've got a year likely for, for these properties to come up with ideas. and But what you're talking about, I think, cannot be done without a town meeting day bond vote. Plain and simple. Even if there's even if half of it is paid for by a grant or a private developer of some in some sort, if you're talking, you know, five homes with an average market value of five hundred thousand dollars, you're never mind the rehab costs, just the purchase costs. Uh, yeah, Eric. Um, I, I think most people who do have flood insurance should be eligible to get another thirty thousand dollars from their flood insurance towards mitigation if it's something that the town asks for or it's a town uh, policy i believe um there's some some stipulation like that in there i forget exactly what it's called i don't know if tom does it's uh i can't remember the name of it off my head i know my policy does have it uh, i'm not aware of that off the top of my head Eric, but yeah if you could send me that i'd, I'd love to see that i mean it, it can help pay for um I mean, mine will, would help pay for the elevation on top of the FEMA. It would pay for filling in basements, and it would pay for uh, raising utilities. If, if if it's something the town has to, I don't know if it's ordinance or um, something the town has to ask for. Okay. But yeah, I can send you the information I have on that. It's, uh, maybe that can help out some people. Some. So, do we want to move on this? Extend until next meeting? I think extending until next meeting. Mike? Yep, I, I just want to chime in, having a little problems with video and audio, but uh, I have a dual concern. Uh, one, I'm really concerned for the, all the people on Elm Street and Randall Street and really any other places that get get flooding but i'm also concerned about a wholesale you know buyout of the of those areas one it's kind of folks who live in those areas especially if they've come there since since irene realize some of the, some of the risks and sometimes they have to you know take proactive measures to protect their properties from doing things and I think, as it's been mentioned by several people, if there was a wholesale way to floodproof a lot of those properties, that seems to be a way to go. But I don't know if the FEMA process is maybe the best way to go. Uh, it's this is just not a very easy, easy, easy proposition. But I am I am concerned, you know, about you know a wholesale buyout, you know, where you know, you're going to have a whole bunch of, you know, vacant lots on Randall Street. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. All right. Um, still waiting to see if we have a motion for this one. If, and that motion could be to get to the next meeting and uh, see if we can have a discussion about this uh, option uh, to uh, uh, create an alternative through uh, a developer. I think it's worth putting the time and effort in to explore other options that we don't have on the table in front of us right now um, before making a decision on this particular property. Uh, do you want to make that a motion? Um, I make motion to uh, further study additional options um, uh, and come back um, at our next meeting to make a final decision about um, 21 Elm Street to whether we um, 
accept the buyout or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Second. With okay. an amendment. Moved, seconded, and with an amendment. Um, since both we have two buyers. Could you, could you just repeat the motion ex exactly as it was uh, stated? <laughs> <laughs> Ian Shea made a motion to further study additional options and come back at the August 19th meeting to make a final decision about 21 Elm Street regarding a buyout option. How did I do? Very good. Thank you. You did fine. It was cutting out before. Thanks. What's the uh, amendment? Just considering we have two buyout requests in front of us that are in the same neighborhood. They're not on the same street, but they're in the same neighborhoods. Now, Elm and Randall are. I guess this is a, I'm trying to figure out the words for this amendment. Are we going to be considering more likely, the likelihood higher in certain neighborhoods for buyouts than others that we would approve buyouts? And what are those neighborhoods before we make, before we jump headlong into going on a case by case basis? Should we be going on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis? And I guess my amendment would be to also include the other buyout that is in front of us, that is in that same neighborhood, for discussion next week, or next two weeks, next week. Um, so, yeah, I think it's sort of difficult uh, within this motion to uh, study all near, uh, affected neighborhoods, but. Uh, what you're suggesting is that uh, we would include Elm and Randall Street uh, uh, requests, bio yeah. requests. Yep. In the same, yeah. under the same uh, circumstances. Correct. Okay. Um, do we have a second on that amendment? I'll second that amendment. Okay. Um, we're voting on the amendment to include. Uh, any requests from Randall Street or Elm Street uh, that would be uh, reconsidered at our next meeting. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now the amended, do you want to read the amended? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. You don't. <laughs> I think what we're talking about is that we will consider uh, both the uh, request from Elm, 21 Elm and 17 Randall Street uh, at the next meeting uh, and try to also explore other options uh, before uh, we can take a final vote on this. Does that sound about right? <laughs> In other words, motion to table. The, I just said uh, Randall and Elm, though. You said the two specific properties. Okay, Randall, anything from Randall and Elm. Okay. Okay. Everyone clear on the motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. This will be considered at our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Brian, thanks for coming. Uh, you're welcome to come up and uh, state your case if you'd like. Well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, every question that's been asked here, every thought that's come out, I've had. Um, and I'm explore exploring every option. And it's, I think it's really important that we keep every option open at this point, including buyouts. And I get it. I get what, I get what it means to the grand list. I get what it means to the house, to, to this town, to have spots of houses. My house, Ned's house, another one here, another one there, what it does to this town. It, it's, it will make a, a huge difference. I get it. Um, there's so many questions. And there's so many, you know, you asked a great question, Roger. 675, why not just punt it down the road? Mm -hmm. And I ask that all the time. I ask myself, and I say, I don't know the answer to that. What I know is we have a problem. 
this is not going to get better. The flooding is going to continue. If you look at the long-range climate forecast, they're talking about many more intense weather events coming up. We'll see what happens this weekend. Right? I think some of us are watching Debbie and going, good God, what if that comes up here and what if it funnels in? What's going to happen? Mm -hmm. We don't know. And I tried to balance that. What are my personal ethics? Do they say, just take the money and run and leave it for someone else? Um, my experience isn't yours, Roger. My experience is whenever it floods, yeah, at the core, you dry it out, you do the business, and it's fine. But it affects every aspect of my life. On top of it, I have tenants that I have to think about. And that's a really important thing, is that I will say, after I read, I literally just dug out from my read two years ago. I went a full year without collecting rent, and that put me underwater, figuratively. I was literally and then, and then figuratively. It took 10 <laughs> years to dig out from that. Mm -hmm. And the thought of that again, I don't have that in me. That is really, really hard to think about. Is mm -hmm. I think about, I would love to raise the house. Oh, that's great, I could raise the house. Where am I gonna go? Where are my tenants gonna go? What happens to my rental income? It's not there. That, to me, is, is a non-starter. I, I can't do that. Um, what I can do and is bring my systems up. I'm exploring that. I'm exploring changing the lay of my land. My land kind of kind of is weird. If, I, if you look at the overhead shot from you know, that the Gordon took um, and then zoom in on my property, you see, you, know, you see my neighbors have green around them on either side, and I'm underwater. Mm -hmm. I think I'm the first person on Randall. That, that the water hits and floods for whatever reason. Um, I haven't seen the you know the layout, and that you know that concerns me. So what can I do? I think it's important to leave every option open. Um, and one I you know I, I thought to Tom like is it possible to get you know private grants for the layouts <laughs> that will allow the town to then you know or a developer to come in and build a flood resistant house. One of my concerns is, um, and it's not just for my house. It's it's all these houses. <coughs> What's the long-term effect of repeated floodwaters sitting there, and what does it do to the stability of the, the ground? What is it? I'm not an engineer. I'm not a hydrologist. I don't really know the answers to that. What I know is that a lot of us have a lot of sinkholes, and those sinkholes just keep coming back. Like that's a sign that something's happening. You, you can fill them in. Um, so you know, I get it. Uh, it's. I like to keep options open. I know, and you know, I've been saying the chances of, of of my request getting approved are slim to none. Because why would anyone, if I'm the only one, what about the ones next to me? Well, what's the value of their house? I understand that. So I'm just here to ask that options get kept open um, because I think it's going to be important that we might have to see. You know, we might want to see. You know. What I hate is another five years, it becomes very apparent that a whole bunch of people come in and say, we're done, like we, we can't, you know, after there's more and more floods, how many times can someone go through this? What does it do to the, you know, what does it do to the town? I'll tell you, this was, that Saturday after the flood, we were sitting there at the Pro Pig outside having, you know, having a, a sandwich and, you know, there's all these tourists in town and they're on their bikes and they're, you know, they've been on hikes and, you know, they're having a grand old time. And meanwhile, the road's closed off, there's dust everywhere, there's like, there's dumpsters right there. And I was thinking, like, there's this, it's, it's discordant. And like this, this idea of like, people are coming here and enjoying this wonderful town without really knowing, understanding, my God, what are people going through literally 50 feet away? And that, I think, over time, if that continues happening, mm -hmm. it does make a difference. You know, this time people are like, oh, that's cool. Oh, you know, I had to wait for a great bike ride. It was fine. It's, it, it was a bizarre, you know, it was just this very strange, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. It's just very bizarre. So I just ask that, you know, I think that as we move forward, you know, think about it. And, you know, I, I think. You know, as you see, there's four houses on Union Street. Makes sense, right? Those ones, they're going to keep getting. Yeah, maybe if there was five or six on Randall Street in a row, that might make a difference. Also, the one-off, I get it. It's not going to happen. 
But it, it may, you know, there's times I just look and go, I sit out, I look over that cornfield, I sit in the backyard and before the corn comes up and goes, and I look and go, the center of that field's above my backyard. It drives me crazy. I, I look and, you know, and I see the water. Could be your next spot. Pardon me? Could be your next uh, spot. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, thank God they didn't put the, the state hospital in there. You remember when they were going to do They were going to put a prison there. Yeah. It, so. it was a state hospital, right? They were going to like, uh, we asked, what about flooding? Oh, we're going to bring in 100,000 yards of topsoil. Oh, great. That would be great. <laughs> Imagine where we'd be with that. Um, I don't know. So, you know, let's just think about, and I get it. Like, if I sell, my guess is who's going to buy my property. It's going to be an out-of-state investor because I have a, a duplex. And it's probably going to go to short-term rental. And they're going to make bank. They're going to pay cash. And they're going to make bank off it. Is that what the town wants also? Do they just want something that I made a point of not doing short-term rentals? Why? Because people need to live. And I've always understood that. There's a lot of money to be made. And that's probably what will happen with my property. So, you know. Do any of us want that as neighbors? I don't. Sorry, you have another question. Right? Uh, trust me, I know. <laughs> so, okay. I, thank you for the time. Yeah, you know. Sure. Thank you, Brian. We will take all this into consideration. Thank you. All right. Those are the three FEMA buyouts for today. Let's move on. We're getting a little bit behind the, the agenda. Community bike share. Sorry, it's like a delay, Jim. Important, important work. Yeah. We have a handout that's similar to what you have in your agenda mm -hmm. packet, which we would like to offer. Can I put it down and just yeah. ask people yeah. to help themselves? Yeah. About a dozen handouts. On the chair now. <coughs> so, good evening, select board and attending public. If you would mind just introduce yourself. Yeah, sorry. Um, we're well, respectful of your time um, and the serious matters on your page today. We'll, we'll try to stay on point. My name is Hanif Nazarali and I'm the community liaison for this community bike share. Next to me here is I'm Ruben McMartin, I'm the Senior Transportation Planner at the Central Vermont <coughs> Regional Planning Commission. So we're here today um, to offer this community uh, the opportunity to join Barry and Montpelier in designing a, a locally owned, locally operated community bike share. Uh, our specific ask, as you know from the last meeting, is a modest contribution size to your community as the local match for a, a V Transit Agency grant that will amount take us to the amount of sixty thousand for a scoping study. What that translates as is a letter of commitment from the town of Waterbury for now. The funds will probably not be required until six to nine months down the line. With the, um, the one-page handout is a map that sort of indicates our hub and spoke model. I think it may, hopefully makes it a little bit of meaning. What we're looking at is a good fit for our geography uh, and the distribution of people in, in central Vermont, which is not typical of bike share contexts. You know, it tends to be from large urban areas. And, and I think one of, at least for myself, the, the background to this initiative is recognizing that we're really being left out. And there is a need to design a different model for our, for our particular setting. <coughs> so to summarize the content of your, in your agenda packet, I do brief, and I'm sorry, I'm reading from my notes to do that, <laughs> um, in two parts. First part, the community model, and I'll say a little bit about the you know, the vision. And the second part is the scoping. And I have a, as a, I'm basically a, I'm just a, you know, you're a regular resident without the technical knowledge, but we have a professional 
uh, at the Regional Planning Commission who will answer some of the issues that you may have around the scoping. So what's different about the community model for bike share? Well, we don't want the challenges that have been seen in the Burlington area. It's the only other bike share that we see operating in, in Vermont. I won't go into those, but it, it is the standard corporate turnkey model. You know, several operators have been there. One of them checked out with only one week's notice. Uh, there are a lot of issues with this kind of random distribution of, of, of e-bikes in that model. So we're looking at fixed locations. That's our difference. Um, it will have to be affordable and have to be inclusive. We're not talking about a bike share for students just to get to, from, from one class from one side of the city to a campus or uh, uh, to their classes. We're talking about quite a diverse community. We would want to see appropriate bike types. And I'm speaking now as a, a coordinator for the e-bike lending library. Uh, for the last few years, it has drawn people from Waterbury, Heinsberg, uh, and all the communities that Montpelier serves. Uh, we are really thinking that not just a standard bike and not just giving electric assist bikes, uh, making them accessible, but hybrid bikes. You know, uh, we have a lot of, in the e-bike lending library, we've had a lot of younger families who want uh, a bike that they would be able to uh, drop kids off and do a large amount of shopping for the family. So, more questions perhaps on the community model. I'll move on to the scoping. <laughs> no, a little bit nervous since I have the professional right next to me, but in, uh, in, in short, we're the scoping studies that looking for assistance from qualified consultants who will investigate and learn, or help us to learn. Key points are they'll identify the strategic locations for the bike stations, and they will be the ones to know the rights of way and the impacts that you, you know, as a select board, would also like to, to hear. They'll be evaluating designs for the bike share infrastructure. So, so not just the stations, but the bikes that I'm, I'm suggesting, charging facilities, and so on. We would expect to have deliverable costly options that would help us to make decisions and to enable uh, looking for the startup funding. And hopefully that opens up um, a lot of possibilities. So we're fortunate, I'll just finish off to say we're fortunate to have the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission that actually took this up. I mean, I can do very little as an individual, and I think the point was raised, even as a single town, um, you know, it's hard to, to, to make a convincing case to do a study, but we have the Capital City Corridor um, as a starting point for this, for this scoping. And um, we're really, I think we're really lucky that we have this as a regional collaboration. And it's definitely been what's driven me to keep, keep as a, just as a community member, uh, volunteering my time is definitely what has really kept me working on this. Um, it gives me great hopes. Um, and I think that what the Regional Planning Commission does really well is also um, do the work of aligning the transportation plans. And, uh, making them more coherent across towns and, and cities. Um, and I think I was really impressed by the, the discussion in your last meeting that there are a lot, obviously a lot of safety issues. And there's always the chicken and egg you know, discussion about how do you actually get safer routes to, to work and to school and uh, to shops and services. And um, my, I, I, I easily make a leap of faith in this and I'll admit to that. But my you know, belief is that if we do have more bikes and they are accessible, then we will be seeing a community pressure because I think the demand is there and I think you know, people are just deterred by several barriers. And safety is one, but also access is the other. And we're really talking about um, not trying to make the money that the corporate turnkey models do. And we're talking about people like Bird, 
who are global operators. I mean, they're in big cities throughout the states and in European capitals. So little old Burlington, you know, has suffered quite you know, at the hands of those sorts of operators. So remember, we're talking about in, you know, engaging the towns and cities and the communities that we serve in the design of this system and ensuring we'll be looking towards a model of local ownership and a lean and streamlined way of operating the system at no cost. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that over to the chair. And I know that you're very interested from the last meeting to hear about community inputs and how I have received right. some. Okay. Um, and we did get some community input on this. So what I heard was largely uh, people not being interested, honestly. Uh, your timing was not great. Uh, no, yeah, yes. Perfectly it's honest with you. Uh, we are dealing with some other more immediate and present uh, concerns. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I did hear from the owner of Waterbury Sports uh, who. Uh, said that uh, this would, would not be a good use of, uh, of town funding. Um, and uh, he is a, a leader of the sport, one of the leaders of the sports community in town, certainly, um, and felt that uh, the roads are not really built for it as of yet, uh, and uh, just didn't really see a real demand for it. Um, so, that was a very, from my standpoint, a pretty significant uh, contribution to the conversation. Um, I'll open it up to others. Kane. Um, I am very glad to hear that you came with a lot of answers to questions I think the community had at, the, at our last um, discussion about this, um, bringing up the affordability issue, bringing up cargo, which I thought I even made a note. Of cargo specific because I thought that was important. I believe Katie Gallagher brought that up at our last conversation was um, folks who necessarily don't drive um, being able to pick up groceries and ride around and I, th I think answering the questions that were asked at that time was it, it definitely had an impression on me this time. Um, I think before I would be able to actively make a decision on this issue I'm going to beat the affordability drum like a dead horse, but I would I would like to know essentially what users would be paying if if the town is contributing three thousand dollars to a study. What are the users of this format going to be contributing? Essentially. Should I take questions? Or should I uh, sure. I would, yeah, if you have an answer to that, that'd be great. I mean, that's part of what a scoping study is going to determine, yeah. right? Is that what's your what is your uh, operating structure right so do you have um, community sponsorship right with with local businesses do you have a co-op model do you have a hybrid model right how do you <clears throat> how do you achieve um, the uh, uh, the low cost operations that allow you to, to operate a lower cost model right and that's part of what scoping would be investigating Mm -hmm. I'll just add a, um, a comment that we're, remember that we're, what we're asking for is a matter of commitment. For me, that the town is actually sees it's worthwhile to go in with the other uh, parties in the scoping study is the most important thing for me. Uh, well, I presented it at the Barry uh, City Council and they made that, that determination that it's not that we have to say, oh, we're going to use opera funding or we have to ra you know, raise the money out of our, our budget. It's rather we're making this commitment. And I know that the mayor called Barry Partnership. And, you know, I'm sure Waterbury has uh, potential sponsors and so on. So I'm going a little bit ahead. Uh, I'm not answering the, the question because as, as Ruben said, it will be, it, I think it's too early to, to sure. answer it. But I have a lot of knowledge of uh, public-private partnerships and, and, and the figures for how, how much, they're running at 30 to 40 percent of the operating costs of the corporate tech key models. So I mean, there's a lot of scope. And 
right from the start of the scoping study, the important thing is having a town behind you, and then I think people step up. So mm -hmm. we actually raised, you know, Montpelier alive from Montpelier. Made a contribution. It's not coming, you know, it's not necessary that the contribution comes out of your own coffers and competes with very hard, you know, <laughs> choices that you're having to make here. Right. What I'm looking for is a commitment. And the letter of commitment is what the uh, grant award will be based on. But if we do, we offer you a letter of commitment, it means that we are committed to finding right. a $3,000 sponsor. Um, honestly, I did uh, reach out, did a little outreach to see if uh, anybody, there was a grant making organization in town that uh, had potential of uh, contributing to this. And we didn't get any bites um, that I saw. We also have uh, Revitalizing Waterbury, uh, the Economic Development Officer is in the audience tonight. Uh, Owen, I don't know if you, you don't have to respond, but if you choose to, uh, Waterbury Alive is the one that made the commitment for, on behalf of the city of Waterbury. Mm -hmm. uh, Montpelier. 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 Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, my Peter, so I'm just wondering if uh, revitalizing Waterbury sees any interest in this. Yeah, we have actually been in touch. Um, I have to talk to my board and see if this is something that is doable. Um, as you know, our executive director is leaving and taking on a group as a fiscal agent in that transition might be kind of iffy. Um, so I have to check with our board tomorrow and see if this is something that we can support. Okay. Other comments? Do you need the full 3,000 from us? Can you? Can we commit with less? I guess I would just say, like, I'll speak to, I think you emailed me quoting me in the last meeting. I appreciate the regional partnership. I have gotten candidly mixed public feedback, and I think we just are in a capacity environment. And just to be real about, we heard, like, the Waterbury Center scoping, and when I just, I've been on planning committees, I'm a passionate planning enthusiast, and I am just worried about the scope of capacity in this community, and I think it's an exciting regional opportunity. I mean, um, I, I so, I'm, I'm torn in that. I think, I hope it, I appreciate the work you're putting in. I appreciate the work CBRC is putting in. You know, for the, I don't, do we think it's worth, like, would we, could we commit for a thousand or something and see if someone else can do it? I think, you know, I, I'm just trying to, I don't, a full no feels hard to me in that I think there's something here, but I think we do have competing priorities and I think we're just trying to weigh that in real time. Yeah, I mean, I tried to say that that's what's important, what's important is, you know, getting on board. Mm -hmm. And I think the number is up to you, really. Um, uh, um, I, I think getting people on board is, is a bit of a challenge right now, honestly. Yeah. Um, but I'm uh, glad to have uh, other board members speak, and then we've got a couple of audience people in the audience who would also like to address this. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the connectivity, especially right here. Um, I do worry about biking between these connected places. Um, Water, as you know, is a small downtown. Bikes are very unnecessary in our downtown area. And in fact, we had, um, I'm sure we talked about this, but the downtown redesign a number of years back that didn't um, incorporate um, any bike lanes or any bike measures. Which was uh, because of right of way, just right. for the record. Right. Right. <laughs> there wasn't enough space. But it's, just, it's, it's not <laughs> even an easy downtown to bike, bike through. Um, and you know, the light in the middle of town is a very difficult light to, um, to bike through. Um, when we talk about the connectivity to Waterbury Center, that is not an easy ride either for heading down 100 on the Guptal, and those are some very unsafe places to bike, and especially our roads being the condition they are after these flooding, it makes it all the more complicated. Um, if we go to Middlesex, you know, riding down Route 2 has somewhat of a shoulder, but not a super safe um, biking. So again, I appreciate the connectivity here, but the feasibility of connecting these different areas um, gives me a little bit of pause. Mm -hmm. Mike Bard. Yes, um, I do have some definite concerns about this. I've heard from community members who are concerned and not that I'm anti-biking. You know, I think bikes, you know, bike share things like this and especially larger cities work quite well. But 
we do have so as other people have expressed we do have a lot of other pressing issues that we we're dealing with right now and i'm questioning whether the community could really invest in you know a, a bike especially when it sounds like you know we we weren't seeing any uh potential sponsors you know come up you know if this was so popular i think sponsors would jump on the bandwagon so i'm a little reluctant to you know participate even though i think it's you know a good project maybe more so for larger communities and as it was said to you know just a lot of our roads are just not very conducive to to uh biking especially for inexperienced people and our downtown is fairly you know reasonably walkable and you know people could get rides to, to get to supermarkets and help them out you know if, if they're not uh, capable of you know getting transportation thanks um and i'll just add that we don't want to get in your way uh so that if you've got support in montpelier you've got support in barry uh it might be best for you to go forward, and then if we can join in and there's support for it down the line, um, we would, you know, we, we, won't. we don't want to uh, stop any interest here, but we have put it out here since uh, this was first brought to the board, and the response has not been positive, honestly. I really appreciate your uh, consideration, like little compete in a competition for your time. I mean, we really do understand this is not a well-timed ask. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. <laughs> Next on the agenda is Road and Pedestrian Safety Plan. Sorry, that was the brunch, but I didn't make the noise, so okay. it just looked it just looked weird. <laughs> Sorry. That's funny. Sorry. You expected me to come up with some idea, but I was um, <laughs> hoping not because I do not have a road safety plan in front of me. Yeah. No, there's nothing. Nothing in the packet. Uh, so I think that this is uh, an outcrop of uh, thank you. Um, some concerns were brought uh, to us about uh, pedestrian crossings uh, yeah. um, maybe a month or more ago. Uh, and I think that the tentative uh, proposal was to put, uh, see if we could uh, put one of those flashing pedestrian crossings at either end of uh, Main Street in the village area. Uh, Tom, do you have an update on that? Uh, yep, we've got quotes. Um, we'd hope to get that done this construction season, flood delayed things. Yeah. All right. But still in the works. All right. Uh, another component of this is, was uh, brought up by Forrest McDonald on Maple Street in the center, uh, where there's been reports of uh, people driving too fast. It was mentioned at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie mentioned it as well. Um, I get an email or a text about it at least twice a week. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so uh, in response, we did put up, what we, uh, the Public Works put up uh, one of those uh, radar uh, signs that measures your speed, which can be effective for a few weeks, and then people tend to ignore them. Um, and so, and that one has rotated to a different area, I don't know exactly where. Uh, but Forrest did email me and ask me why it, would, it was taken down. I explained to him that uh, their, their impact is temporal. Um, and then he wanted, wanted to ask about the feasibility of putting in a speed bump, uh, which uh, our town uh, director, uh, director of Public Works gets excited about. Um, so um, I don't know if there, we want to now talk about feasibility of speed bumps or other signage or other measures on Maple Street. I'll start. Go ahead. Um, I think a speed table, um, I know how much Woody loves speed bumps and speed tables, um, but I think there are two areas. If you looked at Front Porch Forum a few hours before our meeting, there was yet another 
comment about the Neyland Flats Speedway. Um, so there's two roads that are flat and straight in Waterbury Center that people tend to haul down. Um, and where we see the most amount of complaints, and I think speed tables on one or both of those roads would probably be for the best. Okay, uh, so we're talking about Maple Street and Neil and Flats. Flats. I think those flashy lights work great for the first couple days, but you're absolutely right, people tend to ignore them after they see them once or twice. Mm -hmm. right, so, for fast they can get them to <coughs> so compel speeders to slow down with a speed table, mm -hmm. which which can be effective. Um, I know that the, the uh, people on Little River Road are generally happy with their speed bump. You know, the, the the people who drive over it are not. <laughs> yeah, the, there's a lot of gouges in it. Mm, if you, yeah, yeah, it's got been leveled. Yeah, yeah, it's been leveled yeah, off. Yeah. Well, it was yeah. reduced in, in height yeah. Yeah. after it was put in. But even then, um, I think just people with long trailers, um, especially if they've, yeah, I dealt with a few insurance claims and and they're denied. But but a lot of people have, um, you know, they have the hitches and they have the six inch drop. Mm -hmm. So you add in that, you add in the tongue weight of a trail over a good sized boat, and you're pretty low to the ground, and it hits pretty much every time for some people. Yeah. And the neighbors don't love the noise of that, but sure. get to, take to go with the bad. Mm -hmm. My, I guess, in addition to Bill Woodruff's concern about speed tables, and there's a cost, there's a maintenance component. Um, those are pretty wide open roads. I question whether or not a speed table does anything beyond slowing you down for a few feet. If you're gonna floor it, you're gonna be up to speed pretty darn quick after the speed table, so, um, you know. Four speed tables. I think you'd need, I <laughs> well, think so honestly, uh, you would need a series of speed I was, tables. I was gonna make a suggestion, um, just from anecdotal experience. When I was growing up, um, there's, a, there's a street in Randolph called School Street, and it's a hill, it goes straight down, and then it flattens out, and it was dirt. Most people wouldn't speed, because. <laughs> it was all bumps. Uh, then they paved it, and they added three consecutive speed tables at the bottom. And so you only hit one of those before you slowed down. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed to be pretty effective, and they doubled as crosswalks for pedestrian crossings. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having consecutive speed tables, or I, I understand Woody's concerns <laughs> about maintenance and about plowing, but people are ripping down those roads, and I think speed bumps may give, you know, you're going you're gonna to slow down for the speed bump, and then you're going to get back up to speed. But if you have consecutive ways to, to slow somebody down, then they will slow down. Uh, Bill Scheffler? Uh, well, I sat where Tom did for a long time. I think, I don't think they're great solutions. I, I think that um, on Randall Street, we put them in. I think they impact where the stormwater flows. Uh, so you've got that issue to deal with. Uh, winter maintenance on those roads is difficult uh, and made more difficult when you have a speed, a speed table. Um, I think that, um, you know, any time you put a bump in the road, there's enough bumps on Ripley Road, where I live, that's a gravel road, and people still drive 30 or 45 miles an hour. They want to tear up their suspension, that's their problem. But I think if you put them in, uh, you're just requiring me to go over extra bumps. And I appreciate that folks on the road don't like how fast people go. Um, you gotta get some enforcement once in a while. And it's a struggle. I know the state police are, are challenged, but you know, I drive up and down the Illinois <coughs> every day. I know Roger's kid got a ticket on, on Stowe Street <laughs> that one day. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I've, I've never seen the police on the Illinois Flats. You know, something that concerns me way more than the speed on the Illinois Flats is the people that come off of Shaw Mansion and come down and treat the stop sign 
like it's a go sign and not even a yield sign. They, nobody stops there. So there's, there's all kinds of issues, but I think, I think speed tables, um, you know, unless you put them in in several places along the road, um, people that go fast, that go too fast, maybe will go too fast over the speed table, maybe they won't, but once they get over it, they're going to speed up. So I think you're going to have to put speed tables at several places along the road, which I think a lot of people will be frustrated with. Um, and I've been over the one on, on uh, Little River, and you know, I first question I asked is, boy, people who've got you know uh, trailers, well, uh, campers, or or long boats are going to have difficulties, and it's a challenge. And so anyway, I've taken up enough of the time, but mm -hmm. I would ask that you don't put speed tables in on those roads. Thanks, Bill. Uh, it's uh, Chris, and then Mike, and then Kate. Uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to move that we reconsider this at a future meeting. I'm not opposed to anyone's comments, but I guess I will make a formal motion that we reconsider road and pedestrian safety with specific recommendations around interventions and locations at a later meeting date. It, no disrespect to anyone in this room, including myself, but I was like, in consistency to my prior, I felt weird about foliage signage without consultation. I, I'm not trying to slow or, or say it for no reason, but I feel like I would like a recommendation around, I think this is one of those things where haphazardly the residents there are strong, the residents here. I've heard requests unofficially from folks on Winooski Street for speed tables, and I just personally, I'm not a traffic engineer. I don't feel, I'm recognizing Maple in particular, there are some, and Neeland are two specific speeding problems. And so if there is a quick fix around maybe directing Tom on enforcement, I'm open to that. I guess I'm drawing a line in the sand that Alyssa Johnson at 923 tonight doesn't feel comfortable approving traffic infrastructure changes on this item right now. I appreciate that it's called a plan and just, anyway, sorry for the slight. Um, uh, no, I think your point's well taken. There is no plan that we're actually looking at, correct? Right. Uh, so uh, I think we'll welcome any further input on this uh, and try to come up with a plan on which that we can consider at a future meeting. How does that sound? Yeah. Just to add one tiny thing, I don't know if this is so much traffic or noise, but the state has said no to the air brake signs in their right of way. Even if they're, please don't use your air brakes, they said no. <laughs> okay. It's a safety uh, issue for them. I guess we we'll save some money on that. <laughs> but we can certainly do it on Main Street. Oh, Main Street so is okay. We can we can put them on Main Street, so we can order a couple of those. Apparently they are. I am. My thing is not so good. Chris, do you have something to say? I appreciate Kane's concern and efforts to uh, try to curb the problem. It's a problem that seems to never go away. Um, for my particular case, and I know others like me, driving a big triaxle, carrying 70,000 pounds, total weight, uh, if I were to have to confront a speed bump or a speed table, I would literally have to come to this, almost a complete stop. Uh, and then to get Using air brakes or no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for me, it's it's, non-starter um, I actually hit a transition bump coming on to entrance six not exit six and even though it was only that much of a transition that impact and I wasn't going if I was doing 30 I was speeding um, it knocked the uh, support saddle from under my truck which supports the main drive shaft mm -hmm. and then everything else let go after that so um it wasn't you weren't the truck that went off sure. of 89 in the last week no 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 <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, um, the only thing we haven't tried yet and i'll say it again and i'll keep saying it so maybe someday we consider it is doubling the fines um, mm -hmm. there's one guy that lives Right near the trailer park, that I can tell you honestly has his foot in, in the throttle, in the carburetor all the time. Um, and you're right, there has been 
I have seen no state trooper on, on uh, Galen Flats. I did see one going up towards the Galen Flats, and I'm certain they were visiting the trailer park again today, but um, other than sitting there monitoring speed traffic, there's, I haven't seen any, and I travel that road frequently. All right, um, if everyone's okay, we can move on. I might try. Just, um, are, are people aware that the Agency of Transportation does have uh, quite a bit of guidance on traffic calming um, that can be like aggressive striping that uh, changes driver behavior? Um, you know, it's driver expectation that you have to modify whether it's bringing uh, like curbing or even just vegetation close to the roadway that would cause somebody to feel uncomfortable in their car and actually slow down. We've so already got that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Chris has already yeah, got that one. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a way of doing striking and some progressive bumps uh, intervals. So right. that, uh, no, and we have talked about that with uh, the uh, director of uh, Public Works uh, about putting in those white stripes and bringing them in a little bit closer so that you feel Narrower, cheaper. You slow uh, down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's let's have that conversation, King. Uh, no, I mean Alyssa made a motion, and we kind of got lost in discussion. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll make a it. coherent motion uh, um, and see if you all agree with it. Um, I move that we encourage the manager to reach out to the state troopers to encourage additional patrol on Maple Street and Neyland Flats mm -hmm. as feasible, amenable, and revisit road safety and pedestrian safety plan with more info on the state best practices and what we're currently doing in town before we discuss it further. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We move forward. Um, adopt changes to the traffic ordinance. Um, this is an easy one, I think. I didn't bring the full ordinance, but all we're doing is adding, adding the handicap space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. um, I move to amend the Waterbury traffic ordinance to reflect the handicapped parking space located in the Congressional Church parking lot. Congregational. Congregational? What did I say? Congressional? Yikes. <laughs> uh, yeah, second. second. Any further discussion on this one? I just want to make one little point. Um, this is one of those things where by law you've got to publish a summary of the ordinance in the Times Argus, and, and this is just its one of those nitpicky issues that towns have lobbied for a long time to not require a print publication. Mm -hmm. So here's, you know, 100, 150 bucks, something like that. Mm -hmm. No one's going to read. Really? Um, I'll read it. <laughs> just, Bill, if you wouldn't mind <laughs> getting our $150 worth. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll hand you the order there was $150. I'll turn it here to, to the process, but it's the legal process we have to follow up. Okay. There's no way we can like uh, get a three for we have like some other ordinances. <laughs> no. A couple more parking spaces. <laughs> Do we want to throw in some ordinances on the fly? <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> yeah, we got, yeah, got a bunch of things to consider here. Um, okay, but uh, so there will be a cost. Uh, we do have uh, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh. Aye. There you go. Now, any opposed? So it's just yes. that motion. Um, is it because we have the agreement with the church <coughs> that we can do this? Because it's yes, it's yeah. private property, right? It's yeah. that that uh, lease agreement that we have open. Thanks. Yeah. It's because Woody said in the email the board should adopt this space and have our traffic ordinances amended as such. <laughs> That's why I made the motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next is uh, approval of loan for public works truck. Approving the capital equipment note and awarding the, the bid to Union Bank. 
need your motion to say that, so I thought I'd make yeah. it clear, okay. but that's what it is. Yeah. This was a truck that was voter authorized quite some time ago. We didn't pay for it in full until this year. So you, you order a big truck and you, you pay um, essentially half upon order and then half for the fit up. Mm -hmm. So if we order a truck today, um, well, you pay nothing until the, the chassis is delivered to you, but then everything else. So you order a truck today, you, you pay for roughly half of it in nine months to a year if you're lucky, and then the other half of it another nine months to a year. Mm -hmm. um, reached out to five or six banks, I believed. Uh, the days of um, term loans at, you know, f for years you could borrow at or below the cost of inflation. And those days are over. Um, mm -hmm. This is um, the interest rate here is is roughly on par with with what we're getting for our CDs and our investments. Um, what is that? Um, interest rate here is um, five point three seven five. But to say how the environment has changed, you know, five years ago I could have emailed five or six banks and had a bunch of quotes in three days, and and they would have been two percent. And um, emailed five banks, uh, six banks, and got two bids. Hmm. So the environment has changed, but some banks have just said, we're not in the, in the business of municipal lending. We're certainly not a risky customer. Huh. Uh, we're just Why in a do, slightly different world. And what's interesting is if we issue- Why do want to work with us? Um, it's what not us. Um, I think there's just some market concerns. And what's interesting is, um, to use the finance term, the yield term is inverted. So if we borrow longer term, it's cheaper. It's a lower interest rate for longer term than short term money right now. Mm -hmm. So borrow 20 year cash at probably four or four and a half. Mm -hmm. What's the rate? 5.375. For how long? Uh, for five years, which at any time from you know World War II until 2008, that would have been a pretty good rate. And, and then we had this. Yeah. Roughly 12 year period where we got spoiled and everything was cheap. really cheap. Can you consider borrowing it from one of your investment <coughs> funds, borrowing it from yourself or from a fund? And you can, you know, the water department has $100,000 invested and you can borrow 150 from them and pay them 3.5 to 4%. And yeah, but they're earning more than that on the CDs right now, so it, that would short them a little bit. So yeah, and we can, we can uh, there's interest, sorry, there's principal and interest payments budgeted to pay for some of this this year. Mm -hmm. And then and then the future of it, we can determine some of that maybe local option tax. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Favorite place to go. <laughs> okay, um, what's your pleasure to have a motion? Make a motion to approve the loan for the public work truck. <coughs> Do we have to say which bank? Yeah, I think you have to we'll see that a little after thing. Bank. Bank. Yeah. Approving the capital. Uh, Should I start over? Yeah. Okay. So from right there, so approve. Um, I make a motion to approve uh, for the loan. A loan for a public work truck, uh, approving the capital equipment note, and awarding the bid to Union Bank. Thank you. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Mm. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That loan is approved. And there are some signatures. We can just try to get that before the end of the night. Yeah. I yeah. Have yeah. For us? Okay. I'll, I'll start. Pass that one. I'm, I'm the only non government side of the company. That one, too. The project is the same. Okay. So you need signatures on both? Yeah. Oh, just very much. Cool. Seven fun. Okay. It's really true on all three of those. All right. Meanwhile, um, approval to amend the <coughs> boundaries of designated downtown to include the Stanley Wasson parcel. Yes. So 
probably um, probably a year ago, I approached the Planning Commission um, about this parcel, and I, I, I met with Gary Holloway and Karen Nevin, um, Revitalizing Water Waterbury Minister is the downtown program for Waterbury, and Gary Holloway is the, is the state program manager. And we talked about um, adding the Stanley Watson site into our designated downtown. Historically, designated downtowns, uh, the lines were drawn specifically to exclude housing. So our designated downtown is Main Street, but it's not, but it's the frontage, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about how housing has changed and, and how the state complex is no longer full and how having those, having additional housing at Stanley Watson would be a big benefit to our downtown businesses and the town overall. And he immediately understood. What he suggested is that his concern as the program manager was maintaining a, a relatively consistent look and feel of the downtown. So he suggested the state would be amenable to um, amending the boundary of our Disney downtown if the parcel was added to our design review district. The planning commission was also amenable to that, so they added the entire state complex to the design review district. The, the benefit is, as we seek to get Stanley Lawson developed, is that, um, generally speaking, there's, there's a few caveats, but generally speaking, development in a, in a designated downtown is exempt from Act 250. So in speaking with developers, our DRB is not necessarily a pushover when it comes to design review as we saw at 51 South Main. But I think that's a lower bar than Act 250. And Act 250 is, you know, any developer that's Stanley Watson site is gonna be a larger complex developer. It's not the complexity, it's the uncertainty and the time that it adds to any project. So we thought this was the best option to try to um, lower a hurdle for the development of that site. The one challenge, and, and I'm not the legal expert here, and, and it won't be our site to own and GC the development per se. The one challenge is the state complex has an existing Act 250 permit. So one concern is that even if it's in our designated downtown, even if the parcel is subdivided, would, the, would that permit still apply? I don't know the answer, and if it does, it's gonna add some some time for a development there. Uh, but I'm, this will only help to, to lower hurdles. Mm -hmm. So they simply need a motion from the select board and the designated downtown board would meet again, I believe towards the end of September, so there's plenty of time. But they simply need a motion, then I'd write them a memo requesting a change. Perhaps by then we'll have a new executive director for vitalizing Waterbury, mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, I did, there was a question about the Stanley Watson development uh, within the breakout group uh, during our meeting last week. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, question was whether uh, it made sense to do any further development on that parcel, uh, given the concerns about water displacement, uh, building in a floodplain, et cetera. So I think it does for a few reasons. The first is um, it's obvious that site is not going to be a flood mitigation site. The hydrologist is not going to say, you know, excavate the Stanley Watson site. It's too connected to the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But any developer who, who builds in a floodplain um, today, and especially builds some, some substantial multifamily housing, um, it's going to be well aware of all the regulations and well equipped to deal with those issues. Um, if anything, they may improve drainage on the site. Um, so a developer that builds in that site is, is, their options are either to raise the site entirely where they build or build it on pillars. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect pillars would be the preferred option. Mm -hmm. That also allows them to allow for some parking underneath, which I think people tend to prefer. So I'm, I'm, I'm just not super worried about that, to be honest. I think building in the year 2024, really, this would be, you know, hopefully 2025 or 2026, is dramatically different than the homes on Randall and Elm, which were, tip, which were built, I'm guessing, on average, 100 plus years ago. 
-hmm. Other questions? Alyssa. I can, oh, she left. I was going to pick on Katie. <laughs> um, no, I just, I have the map up, which is on the website. And just to say, the design review was pretty significantly extended. So also yeah. just to say, it was not certainly just to include this parcel. It goes all the way down South Main Street and over to North Main Street. This is all in the zoning we already adopted. And I think mm -hmm. this state had its own historic overlay, too. And they just combined with the goal of streamlining. So it's all together. But. Um, I'm fully supportive. I think it makes sense. Oh, Owen also left. Um, and he will have the joy of collecting data and statistics. I would also just note Pilgrim Park is already a like commercial industrial part of our designated downtown. So again, just to say we have a designated downtown that has, yes, Main Street proper, but also some adjoining areas as well. So to me, it feels like it's in character in addition to all the comments Tommy. Do you care to make a motion? If you want me to, um, uh, let me look at the memo so I can word it nicely. Um, I move to amend the boundaries of Waterbury's designated downtown area to include the quote Stanley Wasson parcel. We don't have an address, so. Second. Uh, is that it? I think so. <laughs> okay. Moved and seconded. We got it clear? Mm hmm Okay, good. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. That motion carries. Okay. Turn the word the motion into T-H-E motion. I think I'm writing a song. <laughs> Second that I've heard of it. Um, <laughs> and now we have a discussion of next week, next meeting's agenda. This will be the 19th of August. Do we have a draft in here? Looks like this, the gray on the top. Okay. 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 We're going to have to revisit buyouts. Yeah. Yeah. Buyouts will be re added. Uh, and then revisit the road, road section. Are we revisiting or do we, is that a dead issue? I said at a future meeting, but I didn't give a date. <laughs> uh, I know. The Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee will have something, but they won't have met by their meeting on the 23rd. Mm -hmm. This is the 19th. Right. So they, they will not have met to yeah. collectively vote on support for this handbook at this, like, by this meeting time. So we take them off. I would, mm -hmm. yep. and add them to the first meeting of September. Okay. okay. I'm glad you mentioned the first meeting in September because that's on there too because it is Labor, Labor Day. Day. Yeah. Labor Day. Oh, yes. I will be stretched out on the beach on the Cape But maybe okay. here by that evening. Um, I, I suggest um, so we're, we're at the point with cleanup that it's time to fix or have, or have a conversation about Shaw Mansion and the uh, that could start on the 19th, but the, the legal process, if the one, the select board can just say right now to fix it. But if there's still some some thought about discontinuing the road, that legal process essentially begins with a, uh, it's an on-site meeting on Shaw Mansion at the dip. And it's, it's a bit like a DRB meeting in that you have to essentially warn abutters give them 30 days notice. But if you were interested in that on the 19th, you could come up with a date and direct mm -hmm. us to start that Maybe process and have the conversation. The for discussion. <coughs> Future of Shaw Mansion. Peter's 
so and uh, Lieutenant Howard is uh, scheduled to be here. He's scheduled to be here. I would I would suggest perhaps amending that agenda item, and 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 it can be review of statistics, but that might be a good opportunity to have Bill Woodruff join us with Lieutenant Howard to talk about speeding and, and maybe his experience with some of these other issues. Maybe that's just a good way to round out the conversation and get some better intel. Uh, review of statistics and enforcement, speaking enforcement. Enforcement ideas, all those, all of the above, I think. Maybe enforcement will just cover it all. Yeah. Lieutenant Howard. Uh, housing Trust Fund. Joe just emailed that he was doing some <coughs> statistics um, from the Housing Trust Fund. Yep, Joe emailed and Joe, um, Joe tried to, I think did a pretty credible job of estimating the amount of revenue in local option taxes that would come from short-term rentals and Joe's thought was that that percentage could be a a valid use for the for the trust going forward just applying that percentage and over time maybe we get better data to, to ground truth it um, yeah that's a bigger conversation going forward um, what I suggest is you've got um, a lot of ideas on the table about the housing trust fund and they're all going to take some time to refine, but maybe in the short term, the consideration shouldn't be the specific grant or loan program, but just the money. And maybe you can just decide in the short term if the local option tax is a source, which I think at least that's the only conversation I've heard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe make a decision or, or try to make just an X percent of the local option tax is dedicated. And then you can plan your programs based on that revenue stream. Okay. Sounds good to me. Um, natural disaster preparedness is taken off. Uh, should we put in the place uh, the consideration of the buyouts? Mm -hmm. And that's not. Okay. Then uh, adopt local hazard mitigation plan. That's on a banner on our website. Yeah. <coughs> that is done. CVRBC finished it and sent it to Neil, I think, Friday. Good. So there's a formal adoption necessary. We had also mm -hmm. talked about reviewing the near final draft of the Hazard Mitigation App. Yeah. Application for that grant that's giant and we keep talking about and do the 30th so we have a summary of what's in it when it's going in mm -hmm. recognizing we still might sneak things in after the 19th but okay. at least where we're at at that meeting should we move Shaw Mansion up that'll attract some attention I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to call attention to this mm -hmm. item that's been in our parking lot the whole year um, and that has changed to town meeting format. We are now seven months out from town meeting if we want to discuss it before then. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm not suggesting that we do. I'm just saying it's been yeah. in our parking lot since town meeting. Mm -hmm. And let's, uh, let's put it towards the end of the uh, thing. We can decide what our ideas are about uh, why and how we would uh, propose to change uh, the town meeting format. I know there are uh, a great many folks in town who are very passionate about this issue. Yeah. I would say if we're putting it at the end, I think the wording needs to be really clear that we're like, potential for timeline for a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Why can't it just say first discussion? <coughs> it can. I just, in, in consideration of like the amount of folks we got tonight, which I really appreciate, I think it is something that catches certain folks and some older folks' attention, and I feel bad having them here till 9.45, because to be honest, I don't see us getting through that hazard mitigation stuff quickly. Um, at least the application. Maybe I'm pessimistic. Um, we could put the hazard mitigation towards the end and put this yeah. above that. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Anything else that people would like to see on the agenda? 
I mean, for parking lots, should we do LMT <coughs> plan? That's what's making me so. Think. I would propose doing some of those together, or is that just part of budget? But I feel like there's the piece that's the plan for 2025, but there's also the piece around if we're making determinations of a percentage going to XYZ, mm -hmm. recognizing those could obviously change moving forward, but is that its own standalone conversation around just the division of LOT revenue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Which can be in September, I'm saying parking lot, but mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is at town meeting and LOT. Sure. Why don't we add yeah. to the parking lot and then we can move it off at the appropriate time? Like local option LOT tax. allocation. Yeah, plan. All right, anything else? Are we gonna have any grant deadlines for September, like the ones that have come up that we know about? I don't know the deadline offhand for okay, the. Um, I'll just check. The municipal planning grant has come on. BG. And they all need municipal sign. <coughs> the um, there was an inquiry from the conservation commission about applying for the municipal planning grant. Um, it was determined that it could uh, potentially conflict with our uh, planning grant for the uh, planning commission and the uh, town plan. Uh, I don't know if we need any select board discussion thereof. Um, I'm going to talk with the Conservation Commission and the Planning Commission and just get a conference call set up. And you know what I what I said in email was, you know, I'm sure the Conservation Commission's idea is valid, but we want to be strategic and and make sure we apply um, to give ourselves the best chance of winning the grant. And and if we apply it, and 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 the town. Even if we technically are allowed to, to submit two applications, it's, I think it's an easy rejection. It shows you just don't have your ducks in a row. Right. And I, I do think it would be uh, a bit of a disaster to uh, not get that town planning grant, uh, given the reconfiguration of the agenda for the uh, planning commission. Yeah. It says application cycle will open in July of 2024. I don't see the app with applications due in fall of 2024, so I think we're okay to okay. do that sometime in September. Okay. Did you pick a meeting date for September? Oh, oh yes, uh, that September issue. Um, how about we just knock it down the road a week? Um, so looking at uh, September 2nd. That's Labor Day. So it's Labor Day. So how about we do the 9th and the 23rd? Okay, the 23rd is my boy's birthday, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not available. I'm surprised that didn't show up on my phone. <coughs> no, I'm surprised too. Mm -hmm. I, and I, well, whatever day you pick, I, I'll do my very best to be. What about the 9th and the 30th? <coughs> I was going to suggest more if you did the 9th and then held to your regular 16th, it would free up the 30th for an extra for an oh, extra if needed. Oh, uh, yeah, because uh, yeah. we like to do three a month now. Because <laughs> um, okay. we go home early when that happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, how, okay, 9th and 16th. Yeah. Okay. Everyone good? And 30th. And 30th. I'm just saying. You have the calendar open on this one? Personal oh, the um, sorry, the municipal one. Yes, and I, it's that's better than doing both because we can flip for both. Uh, what plan? Yeah, special special meeting on the thirtieth. What for? More meeting time. <coughs> for Tom. I'm just <laughs> suggesting that. Um, yes, on the night. Four months of the year. Those four months of the year when we have that fifth Monday. Uh -huh. Maybe it should be a good place. Um, my initial thought was, is it, is it four months of the year when there's a fifth Monday? Yes. I have not said <laughs> My initial <laughs> thought was, if we if the select board met on that fifth Monday, we might better be able to stick to two-hour meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the case. I like shorter meetings? Is that right. what you're looking for? So yeah. more meetings results in shorter meetings. <laughs> and, it, and it may be that more meetings results in longer meetings. Yeah. <laughs>
more meetings might result uh, in more getting done. Okay, let's see how that goes. Uh, for right now, why don't we stick with 9th and 16th? And then if Tom comes up with like a really killer presentation on uh, text my gov or something. On the home page, speaking of home page of the website. Yep, we, we threw it up there. That maybe should we like update at the next meeting? We can. Where are we? That's a good. That's a good. I did in like, the lateness. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I did uh, encourage not sharing it at the last meeting if it was. But now that it's up, it feels like we should chat about it. And uh, I can um, share it Facebook from Porch Forum and all those things. Yeah, maybe yeah, after the nineteenth, we can we, we can soft that. launch at our well attended meeting. Probably okay. have some flyers mm -hmm. for that too. Put up. Yeah, and it Liz is off, but like I don't know if Crew and Co have heard about it and what. Are we talking about putting text my gov into the August nineteenth meeting? I just feel like if sure. it's on the home page of the town website, it probably yeah. makes sense to share. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm fine with that. Well, then you know you can just move stuff to September thirtieth. Yeah, I feel like we stack these a little too tight, and then in the two weeks between meetings, you get all these other placeholders that you need and there's really nowhere to put them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll build it the way <coughs> you've directed me to build it, but just kind of have that in mind. We don't, we don't have to make the agenda tonight yeah. so that two weeks from now I'm fielding inquiries about where to put it. <laughs> so we don't really leave ourselves a lot of cushion, let's put it that way. For things that if we have more meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the motion. You all will kill me, but I'll make the motion. Oh. <laughs> Tom might leave, actually, which we've got guaranteed for that matter, so we'll be careful. I don't know if we need a motion for that. Um, okay. Uh, any, uh, any further discussion on uh, the agenda for next week? Hearing none, uh, we'll move forward. Uh, question, do we need an executive session tonight? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, um, I will entertain the motion. And just so we're clear, I have a real estate matter, and I have um, pending litigation, and I have a contractual matter. Jeez. So, too much fun. Do you have to make a motion for all three of those, or can you pack them in? <laughs> I think Alyssa is capable of packing well, them in. Uh, let's hear it. I've tried to commit. Um, I move to find that premature knowledge of pending real estate transactions will clearly place the town of Waterbury at a substantial disadvantage. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, now we're passed. And then I move to enter executive session for the purposes of discussion of real estate <coughs> transactions, contracts, and pending litigation, and invite the municipal manager to join us. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> we are moving to executive session.